welcome to the February 11th City Boulder City Council study session. Um, once again, I want to remind you all that there has been no coup, and Sam is still mayor. <laughs> we are just um, taking turns running study sessions based on our council agenda committee rotation, and so I'm in the hot seat this rotation, or at least um, this last study session, and then um, then someone else will surprise you next time. Um, so I have an announcement regarding um, boards and commissions. The annual recruitment is still in process. Last day to get applications in is Friday at 5 p.m., February 14th. Um, the general requirements are that you have been residing a minimum of one year within the Boulder City limits, be 18 years of age, and other requirements may apply based on the board. Currently, uh, we've received 47 applications, and the following boards have, have not received any applications. The Boulder Jun Junction Access District Parking Commission, the Boulder Junction Access District Travel Demand and um, Design Advisory Board, Downtown Management Commission, and the Environmental Advisory Board. So if you're interested in any of those, please apply, or any of the others. Um, thank you very much. And our first topic will be um, the tribal consultation. Oh, you know, I'm going to do one more thing before I was just reminded that there are two um, subcommittees that we need, need to appoint um, council members to. The first one is the, um, has to do with the police, Ooh, it is um, members um, to part two members to participate in fair and impartial policing command and community training. And Tanya, do you want to talk a little bit about that one? Yes, I can. Can I have my piece of paper back first, Mary? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. So um, the police department is starting out um, fair, and partial, fair and impartial policing um, training. And this is the first time that this training has been brought to the department. This is a nationally recognized training. Um, and we are inviting council members and, and some community members to this first um, training, which is a day and a half. Um, it will be on April 28th from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And April 29th from 8.30 to 1.30 p.m. Um, so we do recognize this is a time commitment um, for council and the council members that do attend, we would ask that you do attend the full um, day and a half training. Um, so I do want to stress that point. Um, this is an area that we have also received significant interest from community members to have a greater understanding of our police training. Um, so after we roll through um, training within the department, we will be holding a four-hour session that will give the full overview of what the day and a half training is for the community. We are tentatively looking at the date of June 3rd. We don't have further details at this time as far as what time of day or the location, but um, more information will be available in the future. So if there are council members that are interested but can't commit to the day and a half, that four-hour training will be um, available in the future. All right. And maybe we can, um, we can think about it, because it is quite a commitment, and then come back to it um, after this first um, topic. And then the other um, subcommittee for which we're looking for council volunteers is the um, engagement creating engagement slash creating a welcoming council environment subcommittee. And that goes back to our retreat when we were talking about um, doing some things differently and trying some different things to um, hopefully engage more and different people. So um, let's think about that one as well. And we'll come back to it um, in between the two mm -hmm. topics. Mary, can I just add, please, please. while you're thinking about that, um, the subcommittee process, we found great value um, when we had um, established a subcommittee 
opportunity for chats with council. And I believe, if I recall, Suzanne Jones and Aaron, you were a member of that um, subcommittee. And so what was really helpful is to get um, feedback from the council at that time to understand what your goals were um, and for us to kind of collectively shape what the process would look moving forward. So based on the council retreat, we are re recommending a similar process um, for the retreat follow-up items. Thank you, Tanya, and sorry for the interruption. Well, good evening, Council. I'm Dan Burke, Director of Open Space Mountain Parks. And uh, before we dive in, uh, for tonight's first topic, which is to help us prepare for the upcoming Tribal Consultation, I just want to first recognize and acknowledge the efforts that uh, city staff are doing in regards to preparing for Tribal Consultation and Tribal Relations in general. It's really a group uh, effort throughout uh, multiple departments. Uh, we meet monthly uh, throughout the year, and from City Manager's Office, uh, we have Jane uh, that attends all the meetings, Tanya, Amy McMahon, Pam Davis, uh, uh, Tom Carr from uh, the City uh, Attorney's Office uh, attends those monthly meetings, um, and Kurt Farnhaber with uh, uh, Housing and Human Services. Uh, we have uh, several representatives from Open Space and Mountain Parks, including Christian Driver, our Cultural Resources Coordinator, and then from uh, City Communications, Phil Yates. So it's, it's quite a team effort that, uh, that we get together once a month. Um, a lot of it is centered around preparing for our, our uh, upcoming consultations, but it also is a chance for us to discuss tribal relations uh, in general. And uh, we're, we learn a lot uh, throughout these discussions and, uh, and throughout the topics that we cover. So I just wanted to first point that out. And to my left, uh, we have Ernest House, who will introduce himself in just a bit. Uh, but Ernest is a senior uh, um, policy advisor with the Keystone Policy Center. And Ernest has uh, uh, been with the city as far as our, our consult, who consults with us on tribal relation issues, including uh, consultation, and has been uh, helping us out with the city for about a year and a half now, I'd say. So uh, it's really a, uh, an honor to uh, 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 meet with Ernest uh, many times throughout the year. So again, the primary purpose for tonight is to help us better prepare for the upcoming consultation that the City of Boulder will be hosting with a, about a dozen representatives from a, about a dozen uh, um, uh, tribal nations uh, that have uh, a recognized presence here in this region. And, um, and Ernest will be, uh, will be using the bulk of the, uh, of the time here in order to uh, give us uh, uh, an overview of what consultations are, what the history of consultations are, uh, what we might expect, that sort of a thing. Uh, but before Ernest dives in and then uh, uh, and, 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 and entertains any questions you have after your presentation, I thought I would just briefly provide you with an overview of the city's history with consultation. So back in the 1990s, uh, there was cultural, uh, there was tribal interest in the NIST property uh, at the time when building construction was being contemplated out on uh, along Broadway. And through those uh, 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 consultations and discussions that the federal government was having with the tribes. The city of Boulder um, was uh, a participant in that, and we decided uh, that after uh, an agreement was reached between the federal government and, uh, and those tribal nations that had an interest in, in the cultural resources on the property, uh, that we wanted to continue discussions with, with tribes as a city. And so we uh, ended up pursuing uh, discussions and consultations beginning in the late 90s through the early 2000s um, and mainly those, uh, those common interests that uh, developed and that emerged from those discussions were primarily uh, interests on the tribes of, 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 of use and, and uh, interest on, on the open space portions uh, of, of the city's interest. Uh, many of the uh, cultural uh, resources that we identify uh, from a city's perspective are located out on, on city lands and the, tribal, and, and the tribes uh, were interested in, in discussing that. And what, is it, what emerged from those first few consultations was a series of memorandums of understandings. Um, I believe there was three or four in total that the city has signed and executed with uh, 13 tribal nations. Um, and 
And uh, the last one, I believe, was amended in 2004. So now we're getting to have the, those agreements are about 20 years, 20 years old. So fast forward to 2016, when the city adopted uh, a resolution, I believe it was 1190. Um, Yes, uh, it was the resolution that, among other things, declared the second Monday of October to be Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, there was uh, several other aspects to that resolution, including the desire to properly uh, uh, name, uh, proper, do proper naming, and out of that was uh, specifically stated to look at renaming Settlers Park and to seek tribal input uh, into that renaming process. So what emerged from that was uh, the city hosting a tribal consultation last March in 2019, in which uh, uh, 14 uh, tribal nations were invited uh, uh, to attend a two-day um, consultation with the Settlers Park uh, renaming a big part of that. We actually went out to Settlers Park and toured the property. We then came back and had several hours of discussion on the, uh, to give them some background on why we felt we wanted to do a name change and why getting tribal input was very important to us. And we learned a lot about uh, uh, how best to work with tribes through that process. Um, at that same consultation, we also um, um, reintroduced the memorandums of understanding that we had with the tribes and went through them. So we work from a common understanding of where we're at with agreements that we already have. And what emerged out of that two-day consultation was a desire to meet again um, in 2020. And part of the agenda for most of the agenda in 2020 would be to continue those discussions on the renaming of Settlers Park and the desire to revisit those memorandums of understanding and to do updates to them as, uh, as may seem fit when we gather uh, later in March. So because we're a little bit more than six weeks away from another consultation and because we have some new council members here, we thought it would be a good opportunity to bring Ernest in uh, to give you all a little bit of a background of what consultations are and some other information that's going to be helpful for you uh, if you participate in portions um, of the upcoming consultation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ernest House. Thanks, Stan. <clears throat> Mike Deguvin de Royock, it's an honor to be with you all this evening. It's good to see some familiar faces around the table, and I look forward to meeting uh, the new members of council. Um, it's an honor to be with you this evening, and as we go through this process, um, I'm approaching this uh, opportunity as if really we're all starting uh, from step one, or really no step at all. If you've worked with tribes, maybe you have an extensive uh, background in working with tribes, uh, or maybe you've not worked with tribes at all before. Um, I'm approaching this with the understanding that that you are. This is the first step, and so I think that you know, based on your your information and background, please, when we get to that, or if there's any type of questions you have, feel free to to jot them out. Uh, over this uh, PowerPoint, I've provided not just what consultation is, what we're looking at doing, what the whole intent is. I'm trying to keep it at a 30,000 foot level uh, because every consultation is different. Every one of them are unique for whatever purpose that brings folks together for. And then also to give you some background or a little bit of why we have some of these conversations with tribal nations who've always called Colorado home. I would also like to first start out with, you know, recognizing and acknowledging that you know, the, the land that we meet on today and, and what we call our current homes today have always been historical homes um, for since time immemorial for tribes like mine, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, Southern Utes, Northern Utes, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and many other tribes that are going to be coming to this consultation uh, in, in, a, in a handful of weeks. So I thank you for your opportunity to, to present this in front of you today. So starting off, I just want to give you a general idea of what the... Um, Colorado's American and Alaska Native population currently. Uh, our numbers here in Colorado mirror the national numbers. Nationally, 2% of, of citizens across the U.S. identify as American and Alaska Native. The same thing goes for here in Colorado. You may think that number should be higher or maybe lower, depending on what states you may come from or if you've uh, grown up here in Colorado, but it's been pretty consistent. However, we have seen a major growth in urban areas in the Denver metro area, which also includes a seven county district, which I would also say would in in uh, include uh, Boulder representation as well. We're seeing the growth more drastically on an incline uh, and an increase greater than we have in the last 20 or 30 years. And I think by the 2020 census, you will see that. 
Um, here are just some numbers uh, across the state. Um, but here in the Denver metro area, we have about 150 to 200 different tribes represented um, from all across uh, the United States. Um, and with the Sioux Nations being the uh, most represented and then the Navajo Nation being members being the fastest growing um, citizens, American Indian citizens we see moving to the urban areas. Now, uh, when the 2010 census happened, there was about 75% um, of the total American Indian population in the United States lived off of the reservation. By 2020, I expect that number to be well over 80%. Um, reason why, I think a lot of the growth we're seeing in metro areas and urban areas are looking for jobs, also look, looking for a better education, greater institutions like CU and others have opened up that possibility to do so. So when we talk about tribal nations in Colorado and when Dan talks about we had invited um, tribal nations last year to a consultation and about 14 tribes were represented and we'll probably get to that number this year. This is a list of 48 historic tribes of Colorado. These tribes have a legacy of occupation within what we know as the state of Colorado. Now, 46 of those signed treaties and agreements that forcibly removed them from what we know as Colorado, some by gunpoint to states like Oklahoma, Montana, the Dakotas. Some treaties like the Fort Laramie Treaty removed a good portion of these. You'll see 19 pueblos on there that all reside in the state of New Mexico. And the two tribes we have today is the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, which I'm a member of, and our sister tribe, the Southern Ute Indian Tribe. So a little bit about one of those tribes, and I'm talking from my experience alone, I wouldn't want to um, give the history on another tribe that I'm not a member of. Um, so this is using this as an example. You know, the Utes, what we know about the Utes. Um, well, there's seven bands of Utes, but a lot of people don't really recognize the three tribes today. The Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in Toyok, Colorado, the Southern Ute Indian Tribe in Ignacio, Colorado, close to Durango, and the Ute Indian Tribe in Fort Duchesne, Utah. Now, the Ute Indian Tribe was also forcibly removed um, before, uh, during this process, like the other tribal nations were as well. And we talk about Utes' uh, historic territory. Uh, the green dotted line represents the vast area that the Utes would hunt, uh, go after game. Now, the Utes also were identified as one of the first tribal nations to acquire the horse by the Spanish. And so when, we, when you may have read books like the Comanche Nation or Empire of the Summer Moon, or even did more research, done more research around Sioux Nations or Arapaho culture, Kiowa, Plains tribes, um, those were tribes that tended to be on the Eastern Plains. Utes, Shoshones, some other ones were more of the mountain people. Utes were called mountain people. We were nomadic, and we always moved around based on where the game were, but we primar primarily resided up in the mountains. The red dotted line identifies primarily that territory which we would be going and, and hunting and, and fishing and looking for game. So if we were to take those seven bands that make up Ute tribes today, this is predominantly where they would be. But again, we are also moving with the elements. We're moving with the climate. So my band is the Wimanuch Band in southwestern Colorado. Uh, we would gravitate towards the Vail Valley, back down to southwestern Colorado, basically, you know, because of the winters, a little bit more warmer climate, a lot goes for some of these other bands as well. So historically, this Next few slides give you an idea of uh, progression of land lost in what we know as Colorado. And I'm giving you this example of just the Utes. All these other tribes went through their own process. And I want to recognize that. But when we talk about why this is so important to tribal nations, I'm getting to that on why the importance comes, why the consultations are so needed today and why they're relevant today. So here is what we have is the map of what we know as the state of Colorado today. I usually like to, like to think that all of this was, was traditional Ute and has been traditional Ute land. We have hunting blinds still standing in Rocky Mountain National Park. Our last bear dance um, was identified ceremony in, in Garden of the Gods in 1908 until we were removed from that location. So really we've represented a large portion of the state of Colorado. But the first Ute reservation was established in 1868 and it was on the western part of the state of Colorado on the western slope. Then 
treaties were renegotiated, and then you start seeing chunks taken out. Now, if you've been to southwestern Colorado, where I'm from, I was born and raised in Cortez, um, then you know the San Juans has over 400 miles of uh, mining tunnels um, due to silver and ore. And so when this was, the agreement at this time was the federal government would keep out non-Utes out of the area in blue, but they weren't able to do that given the uh, growth of mining and particularly in the Southwest. But also the Utes was the first time we were, uh, have, where we had to get approval and seek approval to go outside of that blue area. So like I said, you know, the, the hunting blind still standing in Rocky Mountain National Park or the items and ceremonies we'd have in places like Garden of the Gods, Clearly, this was a, a, a huge game changer for the youth perspective on, on many levels. But then you really start to see the encroachment and you start to see the takeaway from that. Then this was by the 1880s. It was called the Ute Strip. This was also following the Meeker Massacre. The Utes call it the Meeker Incident. I'm sure you can read more about that, which happened right outside of Meeker, Colorado, and which also turned into the battle at Milk Creek. The Northern Utes, the four bands that make up the Ute Indian tribe in Utah today, they were removed at this point from the state of Colorado uh, by gunpoint by cavalry to what then is now the state of Utah. The other three bands moved south, and we both three bands resided on this Ute strip. Now, anthropologists and archaeologists will tell you that Utes have been in what we know as Colorado for the last 10 to 12,000 years. We lost Colorado in 40 years from the 1860s to the late 1880s and the early 1900s. And now this is what our reservation system outline looks like today. So the blue uh, line in southwestern Colorado represents my tribe. That's the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. We're in three states. We have two communities. One's Toyot, Colorado, right south of Cortez, and the other is White Mesa, Utah, south of Blanding. Um, we're 600,000 acres, 2,000 members, seven member governing council, and we can get more specifics that later. Uh, our sister, my sister tribe in the red is the Southern Ute Indian tribe, 300,000 acres, checkerboard reservation, uh, their house out of Ignacio, Colorado. I give you this context and background because um, when we invite contribal consultations or when organizations, entities at the federal level or state level invite to host tribal consultations, it's so important to talk about this from a historical context because when we're just talking about open space, it's not just open space to tribal leaders. Clearly, there's been generations that have utilized this space that we either call home or that we collectively discuss around trails or parks or even certain elements or maybe certain ceremonies were done that we had no idea about. Many of these tribes, like I've said, 46, are not are located in Colorado anymore. Just to have the opportunity to come back to a place that they have always called Colorado home and then held in such high regard is such a huge step forward. And so that's why I want to, to give you that background first before we jump into this portion of tribal consultation. Any questions there before I move into this portion? I have what's probably a minor question, but it came up when I first read through this presentation. If you go to the slide before, yep. what are the green dots? Are those like known areas of, of tribal settlement, or what do the green dots represent? No, that's a great question. They're actually only to represent those communities that are listed. They're on the map, so Walsenburg, Trinidad, Trinidad, give you a kind of general location of where these municipalities are and where they reside. So they don't, they don't, they're not related to any sacred sites or anything like that. Okay, and it doesn't have anything to do with the tribes that were there. Okay, great, thank you. Yes. What is the significance of the number seven? Well, I think for different tribes, it's, it's different. Um, I think especially for some of our sister tribes around the Sioux nations, it means different generations and representation of not just past generations, but future generations. Um, always in the number seven, but there's also a uh, number four that's very relevant, four directions, four seasons. Um, for representations of life. Um, it really comes down to different creation stories of how these tribes, um, what they hold near and dear of how the process they work through. Um, there's certain ways to enter rooms, or especially lodges or sweat ceremonies. Um, 
and a lot of these numbers come out in those types of ceremonies. <clears throat> so it's really dependent on which tribal nation that you're talking to. That's a good question. So moving on to what is tribal consultation? And you have an attachment within your packet that's a um, rather large document. It's about a 50 plus page document. Um, but it's a document that when, as the former executive director for the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs, I served under Governor Owens, Governor Ritter, and Governor Hickenlooper, my office put together. Because when I was in that position, we started the first process for a state tribal consultation. And that was the main question that we received. What is this? What are we doing? And really, the intent is that the consultation is, is the open and mutual exchange of information integral to the effective collaboration and participation in informed decision making. You can go through this list. I'm not going to read that to you. But I'll identify in this next part of the PowerPoint the pages within that consultation guide that I think would be helpful if you do have questions or maybe as you prepare for the consul tribal consultation that you may want to know a little bit more about. And in that document, it goes more deeper into the weeds on some of these things. And I'll identify which pages they can be found on here. So why is there a need for local tribal consultation? You know, this is fascinating. I think what, and I said this to the, had the opportunity to talk with the council last year. I think Boulder has a unique opportunity in front of you. And I think following up on that is, is even better. Now, I was a part of one of those MOUs in the early 2000s. I've just started with the state. Um, it was uh, talking about Valmont Butte. Um, and we were taught, we were called in at the, at the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs to kind of help with the community conversation and what that looked like. Even at that point, I thought that what a unique opportunity you have here of not only communities and municipalities that are in the foothills, but hold such rich, significant cultural areas when the mountains are so close. Same thing goes for Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs has also engaged in tribal consultation, but after their fires that happened, uh, that, those horrific fires, the floods that followed those rerouted a lot of their waterways. And so they were consulting with tribes because more cultural artifacts were identified. So there was a reason to bring them to the table. This one is also unique. You have prior agreements that would engage in a consultation, or you've talked with tribes in the past. And so following up on those would be obviously the number one thing. That also is to enable the creation of strategies, how you look at the potential future of what these open space places mean, these shared spaces that you're, that you're talking about, not just about you know, looking at identifying name changes or even acknowledgments, but having getting guidance from federally recognized tribal representatives on what that looks like. Um, clearly, the leverage of that opportunity that mutually benefits the collaboration between local government, state agencies, tribes, and uh, Colorado's American Indian communities. Like I mentioned, there is a growth of the American Indian community in the Denver metro area, and that's going to continue to grow. The same type of questions are going to be probably brought forward to other municipalities that you're, you're adjacent to, if that's Longmont, Lafayette. Um, Denver's already addressed some. We brought in the Denver American Indian Commission. So different organizations, different uh, municipalities are, are really addressing these in a different way. But it all starts with, with the consultation. And of course, this one was identified under a previous agreement. So when you're in a tribal consultation, it really is cons based off consensus-based uh, decision making. Um, you're providing information. There's really no formal vote that's being taken, you're really seeking the guidance. You appreciate their time, the tribal leaders that have traveled there, and this is the opportunity to talk about what that future may look like, what the management plan may look like, what a site may be. Here's the opportunity to engage and have that conversation, which is why in tribal consultations, there's closed door meetings. The reason why they're closed door meetings is because there is an information sharing there between tribal nations and you all that a lot of these tribes are not comfortable sharing or they've not put it in writing or it's not been shared outside of that entity. Sometimes tribes aren't even required to talk about certain ceremonies because it's not, not that time of the year. Meaning at Utes, we talk about, um, we do traditional storytelling only during certain stories only during the wintertime. Because traditionally we've been in lodges during the wintertime. It was when you'd gather your family. You'd try to gather that warmth, and that was the opportunity to do that. 
you know, a lot of times these tribes will also may discuss sacred sites, sacred areas where the general public does not know, and it will help guide your conversation because there may be a path being created right next to it. You might have a new mountain biking path that's going right next to that that the tribal nations might fear would, would um, negatively impact that space. And that's information that you should know that the tribes don't like to share or would not like to share outside of that um, context. And so that's why a lot of the consultations, especially at the federal level and the state level, are in closed door sessions. We also give the tribes an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one sessions. Maybe there's one thing, a tribe that wants to pull Dan aside and say, you know what, there's, uh, I have a concern about this area. Can I learn a little bit more about this? Or what's this site being utilized? What does that management plan look like? So you might hear more of that as you go throughout the, consult uh, the consultation. Really, consultation, these are different guides. The one on the right is the, the, uh, the government-y one, which I would have loved to change the, <laughs> the front page of that, make it <laughs> not look so much like that uh, in hindsight. But um, other different ones that are, you know, National Indian Education Association. Um, right now, Every Student Succeeds Act, which the Colorado Department of Education adheres to and local uh, school districts adhere to, talk about how to build tribal relationships through consultation as well. So there's all different types of examples of what that looks like. So in that document um, and uh, in the very beginning, it'll talk about tribal sovereignty. What is tribal sovereignty? How do I identify that? We talk about examples of really as it comes down to jurisdiction, because a lot of times that's a little bit easier on why and how to explain tribal sovereignty um, and why that's needed, why we're identifying the, their, this invitation's being sent to federally recognized tribes. Colorado does not have any state recognized tribes. Um, there are a lot of state recognized tribes throughout the U.S. Majority of them are in the south, in the south, uh, southeast. Um, but more and more states, it's really up to them on how they want to recognize uh, state-recognized tribes, but there is a federal process to go through to be federally recognized. And so that tribal sovereignty gives you a little bit more time to talk about that. And then it also goes into what's government-to-government -government relationship. So based on tribal sovereignty, tribes are very aware that because they are seen and because they're identified in the U.S. Constitution as a government and respected as such, then they should have a government-to-government -government relationship, meaning that they should be able to sit at the table like we are today, to have a conversation with you all out of a local entity, at a state, with the state agency leaders, and with the federal leaders as well. Different federal agencies uh, conduct their consultations away. Our state agencies do that very same thing. Um, Governor Polis about eight months ago went and visited both you tribes in southern, southwestern Colorado. We started getting that process on a regular basis, but it really is to respect the government to government relationship. Unfortunately, there's a lot of states who do not take the government to government relationship seriously. And unfortunately, I think that's turned into a bad relationship between the two entities, which could possibly take years to try to cultivate and put back on track. Um, Obviously, it's a mutual ongoing understanding. We try to give examples in that document um, a little bit more of why states and tribes do that uh, and where the, the conversation is unique, where we share a lot of information. The Colorado Water Plan is an example. Uh, first time the Colorado Water Plan, when it was released, we uh, reached out to the tribes to get their input, what that looked like. The State of Colorado Outdoor Recreation Plan, the SCORP, now goes into tribal communities. So these are some examples, but I would think that a lot of these could be examples that the, the staff and others at the city level can also look at ways to engage tribes. We just had the recent outdoor retailer uh, winter show in Denver. Um, more and more of those tribes are being requested to attend those conversations because what does outdoor recreation mean? To tribal nations. Well, if you ask tribes, which we have, a lot of uh, my tribal leaders and others will be kind of confused about that. We've always recreated outdoors <laughs> for thousands and thousands of years. So what does that mean today? And how does that mean? What, what does that mean to our communities? And what are you all doing in communities like Boulder? So that's just a couple examples of, of, of what we mean when, when you look at that page. When we talk about meaningful tribal consultation, now there's been a conversation around, yes, tribal consultation, but then meaningful and the emphasis on meaningful tribal consultation. I think federal agencies and state agencies, everybody wants to have meaningful tribal consultation. 
But I also tell folks that it, it, some, it doesn't, I don't, I wouldn't make a determination on if your consultation is successful by how many memorandums of understanding or intergovernmental agreements that come out from that. If they come out, great. But if not, this is a general session to be able to have that ongoing conversation. Where does it go from there? Um, meaningful, I've always thought were that you are coming to it with a good heart, with a good mind, and you're giving the respect to the conversation. You're giving the respect to the visitors that you've invited back to their homeland and being, giving them in a comfort um, area and space to be able to share what they want to share. Um, this is all about the development of that relationship. Where it goes, like I said, everybody, every unique, every community is unique. And every collaboration where it starts goes through a certain process. Um, I told council last year at that time, I'm telling you all that there might be a time in the consultation where the tribal leaders ask you to leave the room or ask staff to leave the room um, because they need to converse amongst themselves. They need to discuss what they're seeing in front of them. Staff could have presented a lot of information and they just need to get some time to review that. Um, sometimes tribal leaders will need to think about this uh, um, and then talk amongst their peers, uh, but then also possibly go and smudge or do some type of ceremony before they come back to what it is you're talking about. This also greatly depends on the tribes, but for in general, um, time is very different in, in the concept of time is different in tribal communities and indigenous communities. In tribal communities, we tend to take more time thinking about certain things. And so I think a lot of times when I would be taking like the lieutenant governor or the governor or state leaders down to southwestern Colorado to reservations, I'd ask to take their watches or I'd ask to, if I could, um, get their phone, at least for the meeting, because we're so used to looking at this and being caught up with this because that's what drives our day. That's what drives our agenda. Um, but that comes off. Uh, disrespectful because of the emphasis of time. And so those type of certain things are things that we're trying to engage and create this space that really proves that, that you are there and staff is there to really truly get down to not only having conversation about the issues, but then how do you move and, and go on from there, if that makes sense. So part of those tips for consultation, um, and I just talked about um, really the the around what, what some of those examples are. Um, you'll find um, on pages 33 and 34, um, but really it's the time to, to spend on those, like what I talked about. Um, and then of course, knowing that when tribes need to make it, if you're asking tribal nations to make a decision, they need to go back like many of you, if you're representing city of Boulder to bring it back to your council members, uh, to your mayor, same thing goes with a lot of tribes. They need to take it back to their tribal councils, their tribal leadership to make a determination to get more, to gather more information to be able to come back. I think the staff's been really great in, at least in my experience over the last year and a half, around allowing tribes that flexibility to do that, respecting that process. And at the end of each consultation, we'll ask the tribes what that process is to be respectful of how they want to move forward and moving this conversation forward. Additional tips on successful consultation in that document, um, of course, like I said, can be found on, on 33 and 34. I think one of the interesting things too is um, one of the biggest questions I used to get all the time when I was uh, with the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs was, what's the preferred term? I don't wanna be disrespectful. I'm taking this obviously very seriously. I've done my research, but is it Native American? Is it Indian, Native American, or American Indian? And a great question. Um, and really, the, the, the first, what I would always tell folks is the first preferred um, um, language or, or, or term would be whatever specific tribe that was. So if you knew you were talking with the Ute Mountain Ute tribe or Southern Ute tribe, but you may not know that but tribes like to be referred to by their tribal nation. And then a lot of times I'll use in this document, you'll see me interchange between American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native American. Native American is one that's being gradually phased out. Indian is, is a legal term that will be used by Congress and in legal documents, but is not supported, used outside of that context. American Indian is probably the most wider used term and actually 
in even state agents, state policy or with the state legislature, there's a process now to move all of that to American Indian Alaska Native. A lot of times, too, is Alaska Natives um, also come and reside not only in our communities, but then have businesses, have business dealings in the Denver metro area. So that's why it's also important that we're acknowledging the American Indian slash Alaska Native. So if you see American Indian slash Alaska Native, that's predominantly because it's being used a lot more and the transitioning from, but really um, the best bet is to ask the tribes, you know, what their, what that pref preference would be. But a lot of times it's the first form is going to be the best case is going to be the tribal nation. What that you're working with. Yep. And that set of terms you didn't mention indigenous. It's a great question. Um, I think indigenous is also a term that's used on a very broad scope. Um, and when I talk about indigenous today, there's indigenous cultures, um, both Latino, Hispanic communities in southern Colorado, northern New Mexico, that um, have also been a part of, of different indigenous communities, both historically by migrating from Mexico. Um, I think indigenous to the land can also include some of these groups as well. When I'm talking about American Indians, we're talking about, I'm talking about federally recognized or state recognized tribes. So that's the distinction. I think that's a very good question that you talk about though, because when I talk to um, colleges or universities today, especially when we're talking about indigenous knowledge, there's a lot of that shared indigenous knowledge that's passed on through different groups. Doesn't matter which tribe, which community you come from, you belong to, that doesn't matter. But there's an indigenous knowledge of, of generations or groups of people that have been there for a long time that I think are under the umbrella of the term indigenous. So here, the last two slides um, are really the uh, a couple of pictures, and I, sorry, I apologize, I'm not a photographer, clearly. Um, but, so a lot of the back of the heads, but to give you an idea of the picture on the left was the format that we've used is really, I mean, circles always are, are important, but when you have a large representation, uh, like up to 14 tribes, um, you know, rectangles use, I mean, we're trying to try to in, in have everybody see that we have a, a place on the side for uh, the public for the very opening. And then, so that's the, the picture of what that looked like. Representatives are scattered throughout the table. It's not in any type of format. We're really where they would like to sit. Uh, the picture on the right is when the tribal representatives wanted to go see and tour. I think this was Settlers Park. So they wanted to go <coughs> tour that and see that for themselves. Again, some of them have never seen it. Uh, they've never been there. Uh, so it was important to, to do that. The picture on the lower right was the when we first got to Settlers Park and staff were giving some background, which is always important. I think it's going to be important that you see this next consultation, that, uh, which was a direct quest out of the tribes, that they see these spaces that they're talking about, that it's great to have this information on paper, but really, as we would all agree, it's, you know, to see it is even better, to see that majesty and the majestic locations that, that have, uh, that is being discussed is really of, of the importance. And then the top left is actually at the very end. And this is, um, this happens on different consultations depending on which, you know, where you go, but here was an opportunity to do some gift exchanges. Uh, some some gifts, some small gifts from the community of Boulder to the tribal representatives for being there. But then, and then for you, Council, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I thought it was a very powerful moment when the tribal leaders wanted to return that. Um, there's no uh, outline to the tribes didn't were not aware that that there was that the city of Boulder was going to be presenting them with anything, um, and so they really appreciated the hospitality that was shown by the staff and council. And so they took this opportunity to provide their own gifts. And so that can happen also um, at, at, at any point. Uh, but again, it's nothing that's expected. It's just something, especially for, but on, on the Boulder side, it's always nice. And we've already had that conversations on making sure that that uh, is still extended to the tribal representation uh, this year as well. The Goyak means thank you in Ute. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I really do appreciate this. I mentioned earlier, and I can't emphasize it enough, that if other communities could watch how you're holding this conversation, 
not only would I be impressed, but I think that other communities and other tribes would be impressed. And we'd have the opportunity as Native Americans and American Indians uh, to be able to extend that conversation further to be reconnected to the areas that we've always called home. And so I just thank you for your time and your workshop. I know you have a very busy agenda um, and I hope and I look forward to the opportunity to see you in March. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ernest, thanks so much for that and for your help this year and last year and in the past. Um, I found the, the tips for the uh, successful consultation extremely helpful last year before that. So for council members who are participating, I highly recommend reading that through carefully. I'm going to reread it this year before I go in. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Sam? So I will just <clears throat> put out there for the new members. Uh, this experience for me was one of the more eye-opening experiences that I have ever had on council or in a lot of other settings as well. Um, it was not only a <clears throat> look into a different way of relating to decision making than I experience here on council and other settings, business settings and so on. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity because it is a little transformative in a way that I didn't expect. And the picture that was shown on the previous slide of the gift giving ceremony, um, this was a circle that was formed by the visiting tribes after we had taken a photo of the entire group on the bridge over Boulder Creek. And we were mingling and talking and this circle formed and then leadership was invited into the circle and it was focused on female leadership in particular. And so the gifts that were given were to Suzanne Jones, who was mayor at the time, and Jane Brodigan, the city manager, and the other women who were there from Boulder in leadership positions. And the emphasis that was made by the, the woman giving the gifts was the wisdom of the grandmothers. And she gave the gifts and gave a speech, and then they um, sang, I think it was the White Buffalo song, or uh, White Buffalo Mountain song, and it was incredibly touching and very powerful. So I would just say, take advantage of this opportunity because it's unique. Thank you, Sam. Bob? First to Kulia. Thank you very much. Um, Ernest, will the, um, I, we had what, 14 tribes last year, last time, last year participating? Correct. Will the, uh, the participants uh, next month be largely the, the same tribe, so we have that continuity of the continuation of the discussions that were started last year? So the invitation has been sent to all of the tribes uh, from the very beginning, just like last year, 48 historic tribes of Colorado. And, um, but I think because those 14 have, have been involved in the conversation over the last year, that's probably what you'll tend to see. There also has been some specific requests by tribes by inviting other sister tribes. Those tribes are still on this list of 48, but maybe uh, because you have, to, you have to take into account too that like for my tribe, um, there's really, there's two people that handle all of the cultural issues and are invited is so many different states and across the nation. So they're trying to divide up their time. And so it's just a, a matter of ensuring that they have the information and that also that they can provide that feedback if they, if they cannot attend personally, but then want to be involved in some way. But there's also going to be an extension to those tribes who have shown interest, but then also have asked that other tribes be invited, ensuring that they were invited as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we have some new tribal representatives or, or new tribes that have, didn't participate last year, Christian on the day before is going to offer a tour of Settlers Park again, just to reintroduce folks that maybe didn't have that opportunity last year. So uh, we've put built that into the agenda. Any other questions, Sam? Just one more question. Um, the subject of um, folks who identify as American Indian, but who aren't part of a um, recognized, federally recognized tribe. How is, is that going to be something that we deal with now, or is that something that would come later? Uh, it was an issue that for me was a little confusing as to how, and it was explained that the federally recognized tribes had standing, but I was just curious for the, the folks who aren't part of that, who want to be part of maybe 
using the the open space. What's the perspective on that, just for a refresher? Yeah, so um, I mentioned on the offset, intentionally mentioned that uh, there's a group of staff that meet monthly, and we do talk and discuss tribal consultation, but we actually call our group tribal, re uh, tribal relations uh, because of that very subject, is that there are, um, there's a, the different subject of how we uh, have uh, build relationships within the uh, the urban areas and, and the folks that maybe don't affiliate with a federally recognized tribe. And so um, we sort of, I guess, would have two tracks. We have this formal consultation with federally recognized tribes, and then we're trying to build an understanding am uh, with amongst the city of what it would mean to have meaningful relationships uh, uh, with uh, of, of urban American Indians that may not associate with a federally recognized tribe. So that's where we invited folks from Denver to let, uh, hear from what they're doing. And what we're beginning to understand is that there's an appreciation, and we even had some requests from American Indians to, to not only think about it from a city of Boulder, but more of a regional context. So now we've reached out to Boulder County, we've uh, reached out to Longmont and some other communities that are having the same conversations. And just in a, in a month or so, staff from all the, from the region are going to be are, are begun uh, are going to be starting to meet. Out of that, we don't know what's going to come out of it, but we're trying to develop a way where we can deepen those relationships and deepen conversations and where issues that may be important to uh, uh, American Indians in the urban areas, where they, they might be able to bring those concerns and uh, trying to come up with what the be best mechanism will be. So we're about a year into those conversations, and now we're just beginning to have more of those regional conversations. Any other questions? Can I just add to that um, a little bit? So uh, something that came up last year at Tribal Consultation was specifically from David Young. Um, and David Young has previously approached council to um, wanting to be part of the conversation within this space. So we have been meeting with him specifically around this space and how do we how do we move forward with tribal consultation with the recognized tribes and also recognize and respect individuals within our community such as David? Thank you for that, Tanya. Any other questions? All right then, thank you, Ernest. And thank you, Dan. Thank you. For coming out. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we have the staff change. Um, is anyone ready to um, volunteer for any of the, either of the committees that were brought up? All right, um, Rachel and Mark, which? I'll volunteer for both. I, I don't wanna over <laughs> overextend or block anybody out, but I'm interested in both. You have a lot of free time. <laughs> I'll, I'll volunteer for the training. Okay. Bob? I'm interested in the community engagement. All right, it sounds like we have two teams. Got that? Thank you for that. And we will um, share with all of council uh, when the um, June 3rd community training is uh, for the fair and impartial policing as well. All right, thank you guys for volunteering. Mm, let's wait a second and then uh, we'll get going. So there's also, I just want to let everybody know, there's a sign-up sheet going around for the tribal consultation schedule. Katie, do we get this presentation? Today? Yeah. That's helpful. I don't see it. 
All right, so why don't we get started? So tonight's conversation is really a continued dialogue from last year um, when council had discussed library district and a commitment that we made um, as a city to the library commission as well as the library champions to really focus on financial sustainability of um, our library. This was an aspect that was really a cornerstone of the library master plan um, as well so that we can um, really look at library services in the future and achieve components um, of the library master plan. So some of this information will be information that you've heard last year, um, both from David um, and Katie, as well as uh, revised or updated information relative to financials. I will also indicate that Kim Setter um, is in the audience. Um, Kim is recognized throughout the state of Colorado um, uh, as a library district guru, I'll, I'll call it, um, and is available for council questions. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I'm David Gear with the city attorney's office, and I guess I'll just ask Kim to come up to the table now because um, I got a feeling that you guys are going to um, shortly put him on the hot seat. Um, also here in the audience from our office is Janet Michaels, who has been one of the laboring oars in terms of doing the legal work associated with understanding district formation, and Alyssa Dinberg from the city manager's office, who's been helping us as well with that research. So at your table, there are some materials that are intended to respond to some of the questions that were raised during the council agenda meeting this week. There's some inf materials on um, districts and the formation process used in those districts, as well as some information related to how assets were distributed upon, uh, uh, library assets distributed upon the formation of a district. Um, one of the interesting things that I pulled from the materials that David Farnham put together tonight um, was that um, there has been one district since Fort Collins that has done so by um, by, by way of a petition and election. And the Fort Collins Poudre Valley District was formed in 2006. And it's been one of the, it's been a district formation process since we've been dealing with the Boulder Library champions um, since they started their petition and that we've kind of used as one of our guiding touchstones in terms of um, how another community has gone about dealing with the question of district formation and then of course the process associated with that. As you are all aware, uh, the Boulder Library Champions um, submitted and circulated a petition with the objective of forming a, a library district. It was presented last summer to the county clerk for signature verification. Um, as we all know, the timelines in the library law are fast moving for forming a district and as this process was unfolding, the city asked the library districts, or the library champions, to withdraw their petition for, for consideration at the 2019 election and let the city have a robust conversation about library funding. So tonight we're kicking off that discussion. So this kind of, as I've tried to both understand and explain library district formation, there's a lot of repetition in the two approaches that are used to form library districts. But basically there are two process, processes. The first is by way of ordinance or resolution, and that looks a lot like a basic standard legislative process by the governing entities involved. And once that happens, um, there are a variety of um, actions that happen. One, one of the most important being that upon the formation of a district, um, you will end up having to appoint a board of trustees um, and enter into an IGA with that district. Um, as you see in the chart, um, the same thing happens as you're doing the petition process, that you move through the process and the, the library law um, often tells you, please look again at doing it by the ordinance or resolution process. So there's a process actually in the, uh, the petition process where you look at forming it by a resolution. And then if you don't do that, the city has an opportunity to either opt out of the district or let it go to an election. 
So could we go to the next slide? So I'm going to go into a little more detail about um, each of the processes now. So if the establishment is by resolution or ordinance, the process includes the following steps. First, there's a public hearing following notice that will be held by any governmental unit that's participating in forming the public library. So in this case, the city and the county. Public hearings include a discussion of the purposes of the library district to be formed, where more than one governmental unit is involved. There is a discussion of the powers, rights, obligations, respons and responsibilities, financial and otherwise, for each governmental unit. Uh, the resolution itself, um, when adopted, forms the district, but it describes the district's legal service area. Um, it, it should specify a mill levy and property tax dollars to be imposed or other type of funding that will be used um, to fund the district. Um, and it states that, uh, it must state that the electors of the library district must approve the amount of a tax levy not previously established by a resolution or ordinance or previous, previously approved by the electors. So upon adoption of the resolution or ordinance, the legislative bodies, um, one, as I noted, they establish the, the district as a public library and provide for its financial support beginning on or before January 1st of the following year. So that's a pretty quick time. Um, or if the tax has not previously been established upon the formation or upon the adoption of some measure to approve a tax to fund the district. Uh, there is a board that's anticipated um, with a library district and it, when, the dis when that is created, the, each entity um, appoints a couple of representatives to actually appoint the first board to the library district and thereafter each of the legislative bodies will ratify uh, the members of the uh, new library district board. Go to the next slide. Um, the board, in terms of steps that has to happen after the resolution, within 90 days, unless mutually extended by the parties, um, there should be an IGA drafted, and of course, the, uh, you know, a board of directors would, would be seated within that time, time frame. Oops. Can you go to the next one? So this is the petition process. It's a little bit different, but many of the steps actually are quite similar. Um, basically, uh, there, it starts with the committee of petitioners that develop a petition, and it will request the establishment of a library district. It names the governmental units establishing the library, and in this case, that's Boulder County and the city of Boulder. Um, there's a description of the legal service area for the district. And, and then there is a specification of the mill levy to be imposed and the type of funding that the electors have to approve to fund the district. The petition itself is addressed to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and there are requirements related to how the costs, and I'm not going to go into that tonight, but how the costs of the district election are allocated amongst the various parties. Um, once in receipt of the petition, this is what the caddy has. Again, the library law directs you to consider passing a resolution or ordinance um, at the onset and forego the need for an election. Um, if that doesn't happen, um, then the question of establishment of the district will go to a vote at a November election and then, of course, there is a Tabor tax measure that can be held concurrent with the formation of the district or passed at a later date. It's right before the process, it's right at this process, this time in the process where there is a window of time where if the sit, if the, if one of the establishing entity that, that have a public library don't want to participate, they can opt out. There's a very small window for when, and in this case it would be the city, could opt out of the district and not participate. Um, 
thereafter, once in the district, when you read the library law, it appears that it's very difficult um, to get out of the district. Um, then, of course, once you've had your election, the process is pretty much the same um, as the resolution process in that um, you have to appoint a board, enter into an IGA, um, and address the, um, you know, how all of the governmental entities will interact with each other to support the library district. So with that, I think I will call it a close, and I open it up for your questions. Bob. Thanks, David. That was really helpful. Um, I don't know if this goes to Kim or David. Um, so just to recap, uh, um, I have two questions. One is just to confirm my understanding, and the second is to a follow-on question. So David, as I understood it, um, if a petition is delivered, first of all, the petition is delivered to the county? That's correct. That's all right. And then once the petition is delivered to the county, then cities that are affected by that petition have a choice of either passing a resolution, three choices, passing a resolution, submitting the question of establishment for a vote, or opting out, is that correct? That's correct. Those are the three choices. They may have different time frames, but those are your basically three paths. Bob, can I colloquy as well? Sure, then I have a follow-up question. Just, yeah, just as um, part of that, the vote that is, you know, you can either form the district or, or vote, Who? what would be the boundaries of the, the voting district? The case? boundaries are established by the petitioning committee. And so the vote that would be held would be run by the county within the boundaries of the district as presented by the petitioners. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And then my second question is, so the petition, uh, the petition is submitted, uh, the cities within that boundary, as Sam described, can either pass a resolution establishing the district, um, submit an establishment question for a vote, or opt out. Um, are they also, is, this, is, the, is there also a requirement as a result of a petition to have a Tabor vote? Is that required um, as a result of the petition? It, it sounds like it's required. If you don't pass a resolution or opt out, it sounds like you're required to have an establishment vote. Are you also required to have a Tabor vote as well? Uh, the statute provides that within a 90-day period after formation, the establishing entities have to provide for the funding of the district. So that is typically done by having a Tabor vote. Uh, we have some districts that have never done that. Gilpin County supports its library district on its own. That's so going to change next year. But The established entity would be who under that scenario? Uh, in this case, it would be the county or and or the city of Boulder. So you could continue to support your library system the way you are now and uh, allow the library district to then go on and figure out its funding sources from there. But if the, if the, um, if the boundaries established by the petition um, are extraterritorial that are beyond the city, who, um, who, who must, you said the statute requires that, that somebody must fund that. Who, yes. who, who's the somebody if it's beyond the city of Boulder? The county. The county must fund it. So if there was, so there's no requirement that there be a Tabor vote. Is that correct? There's no requirement. There is requirement for funding to be established. For funding to be established. So you could have a situation where a petition is filed, um, <clears throat> and there's an establishment vote, or an establishment vote, but for a period of time, maybe indefinitely or for a year or two, yes. either the county or the city or some collection of government entities could fund that organi that district for a while. Correct. And if they decided they wanted to do something different, they could always go to a Tabor vote. Is that correct? Correct. Got it. Thanks, Kim. Thanks. And I just, sir, if I might ask you to speak a little bit more into the microphone, it's a little hard to hear you. Thank you. Mark? Am I understanding the process correctly that, in, in effect, we're going to, if there's a vote, the vote would precede the negotiation of the IGA? Yes, because you haven't formed the district yet. <laughs> Is there a way to engage in a process of negotiation to determine what the IGA will look like before going to a vote? 
I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable in not going to our voters and being able to inform them as to all of the substantive characteristics of what we're asking them to approve, um, whether it's leasing buildings, conveying fee title to buildings, uh, and on and on. Um, it would be nice if, if we could inform them of those things at the time we ask for their approval. Is that possible? Mr. Wallace, that's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> and we've, what we've found over the years is um, we strongly encourage the formation by resolution for the very reason that you're pointing out. Because then you have, um, in order to have an IGA, you have to have two sides to negotiate that arrangement. If you form the entity by resolution, and then within that resolution, say that it'll be dissolved if the funding doesn't take place, um, you now have the library district with whom you can negotiate the IGA before the election, so that when you go to the Tabor, the funding election, everybody knows what they're voting on. And is there a way to extend the IGA, the negotiation of the IGA period? You had mentioned 90 days. It, it, uh, yes, it allows for an extension. Okay, because the, it's a the bit risk. Is there any limit on the extension? There's nothing in the statutes and there are no cases, but I, I think it could actually go on for a long time. But remember, during that time, somebody else is funding the library district. And, and in the cases that you've seen where it's been extended, well, let me ask it this way. How long does it typically take to negotiate an IGA? It takes a lot less time than you would think. It sounds very complicated, but um, if once you've determined what you want to do with the library district real estate, and you know, you're know you not going to keep the books, you're going to turn those over to the library district. Once you figure out how you want to, to handle the personnel and um, their employment benefits, which is, again is not that difficult, it can go into the IGA fairly quickly. The IGA can then also um, extend the time period over which these transitions take place. So Pooter in Fort Collins, um, we drafted that IGA so that the library district was buying services from the city. So uh, accounting, um, purchasing, all kinds of things go through the city. The library district pays the city for those services. And most of that has continued since the formation of the library because it worked out so well for everybody. Aaron? So uh, would one possible path be that we could form it by resolution and then we negotiate an IGA with the county that would lay out, and the, and the district, right, with the, with the, the um, trustees, um, that would lay out the form that that would take and then say put in a contingency on passage of a Tabor vote and then say, okay, in the meantime, business as usual. We run the library exactly the same way it runs today, funded the same way, but that if the Tabor vote passes, then the new IGA kicks in yes. at that point. That's exactly what we do. Okay, great. Thank you. I call a colloquy on that, Mary? Please. And in using Aaron's model, that presumably could also happen if there was a an establishment vote as well. In other words, um, one one option in response to a petition would be to pass a resolution. Another response, as, as I think you've indicated, is that you could have an establishment vote without that funding. Um, and if it's established by the vote of the people, then the funding can come at some later point as well. Is that correct? That's correct. The, the problem with going that direction is you you miss out on that opportunity on the front end to inform the voters of what the real plan what the, what, is. Yeah, what it is. That, that was Mark's point. Well, who, who decides when the... So so let's say the, the voters have established a district, and let's say it's beyond the, the range of a city boundaries. Who, who decides what, how, and when of a, of a Tabor vote? Is that the county? Is that... Um, the city, who, who decides that? Again, it's part of the establishing entity's duty. So if it's in the petition, the petition would probably say at the next general election. Um, but really it would be part of the, if you didn't do that on the front end and you established by, resol by resolution, you could agree that that could take place over time or it must take place within a certain amount of time. Um, going back to Fort Collins, what we did there was to 
formed the district. We entered into the IGA. And then within the, the formation resolution, it said that the district must become funded, self-funded within like three election cycles. Yeah, I was, Mike, thank you for that. But my question was more along the lines of if, if the district was formed by a vote as opposed to by resolution. So um, you mentioned the establishing entity decides when the vote is. Who is the establishing entity? In this case, it would be the county. The county. And so, possibly the city if you choose to participate. So, so if, if the petition is filed, we go down the path of an establishing vote? Yes. Um, it's the county who gets to decide whether the Tabor vote happens at the same time or at some subsequent time. Is that right? Yes, but typically that would be already be in the petition. Well, okay, that was that was the core of my, my prior question. If it's in the petition, must is there a requirement, even if the county and the city don't want it, there's a requirement that you must have a Tabor vote? Yes. Okay, so that was a little different than the answer I yeah. think you gave me before. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mark? Let me ask you the question in a, in a, a little differently. What can go wrong, and what do you do about it if something goes wrong? I'm sure not, not every district has, has been a seamless, positive experience. Um, what, what's the downside? They actually have been very positive. <laughs> All of them have turned out wonderfully so far. <laughs> um, I, you know, the places that I, over the years, have feared something was going to go wrong mostly had to do with a situation like yours where you have an established municipal library. And I always feared that somewhere along the way somebody's going to say, we're not going to let you use the library building um, or we're not going to give you the books. We're going to sell them to somebody else. Um, that's never happened. But if it did it would leave the library district as an independent government entity that would then have to go figure out where it's going to house the libraries and where it's going to get its materials and books. And one, one follow-up. If assets were actually transferred to the library district, does the city retain any control over the disposition of those assets? Yes. Um, some of our library districts, the libraries are rented by the <coughs> well, library I'm, I'm, district. I'm, from the One city. of the possibilities is a uh, is a transfer of, of fee ownership to the to the buildings. Yes. Correct? Um, would the library district then be authorized if they chose to do so um, to mortgage out those buildings for additional funding? No. Um, two things with regard to that: they don't have the authority under the statutes to do a mortgage to to um, use their property to lien their property. Uh, their pledge is their tax revenue if they're going to borrow funds. Um, uh, what was I going to say? In Adams County, uh, what we did was we transferred all the library buildings to the library district with a right of reverter on all of the buildings. So if the library did something with the buildings that the county didn't want, they could pull the buildings back. And then as time went by, we ended up getting rid of every old library building and building new ones. And each time we would just say, "Can you? will you release the right of reverter so we can sell the building to help fund the new libraries? And they did every one of them. So I have a follow-up on that one. Is one of the methods of dealing with um, the assets, is it possible to just lease or... Um, turn over the buildings, but not the land. Yes. Again, that would just be a lease, a, a lease of the building. The city could continue to own the building and the land, and the library district would just lease the building. So would it be possible to have the library district own <clears throat> the building, but not the land? Yes. It would get complicated. <laughs> the agreement would be complicated because you'd have to figure out what happens if the city wants to do something different with the land. How do you unwind the, the building? And But it can be done. Thank you. Um, Mirabai? Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought you had... Sorry. Sam? So following <clears throat> Bob's questions again, um, petitions are submitted to the county, so 100 signatures, and the decision is made by 
the county and the city to have a formation? Would it be the county and the city, or would it just be the county? We want to. I'm trying to figure out who can say we want a formation election. Yeah, it would just be the county if you went strictly with the petition. Um, and then the city would have the opportunity to just opt out, but that would be the city's only opportunity. So, in other words, the county, at that point, once the petition's put in place, the county can form the district by resolution? Yes. So that's the county's choice. Once the petition lands, the county can form by resolution. Correct. Or the county can refer it to a vote, a formation vote. Correct. And if the county refers it to a formation vote, you said the disadvantage there is that you don't get a chance to explain to the voters what the uh, terms would be. Yes. For an eventual Tabor vote. Yes. However, if the formation was successful, then there would be the board of the district appointed. Correct. And then there would be negotiations of an IGA between the board, the county, and the city. Yes, and bringing the city into that would be a matter of, of courtesy or comedy, because if the district's been formed by the county, presumably the city would have opted out. I'm trying to follow that, because yeah. why would presumably the city have opted out? Because if the county forms the district, Correct. And the city doesn't opt out. Does the county own any city property? No. What you would have then is a city library, and you would have a, a library district. Which encompass the city. Yep. And they would be overlapping taxing authorities uh, on the city. So the city already has its taxing authority, leaving aside the very small 0.3 mills property tax dedication. The city generates its money through sales tax and through a little bit of property tax. But um, so the city would continue funding its library district and there would be this overlay. And so then wouldn't there be the possibility of a negotiation between the city, the county, and the district governance, which is the board? Excuse me, Siri, Siri wants to talk to us. Um, <laughs> So I, I guess I'm going to walk it through again. Okay. I found this on the web. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to, Siri's going to explain it instead of you. <laughs> Siri, how do you form a library district? That's right. <laughs> In Colorado. <laughs> so we, we have, we have, petitions have been submitted, county formed, the, the dist, referred it to a vote or formed the district, whichever. Vote successful. Now there's an overlay. There's a uh, <clears throat> library district, and there's Boulder City, which has its libraries. And presumably, discussions would begin then if the library district wanted to go forward and fund itself. It would say, oh, city, library system, would you want to be part of this? Would you want to city council loan or lease or give or whatever? your buildings to us, so that negotiation would still happen at that point, could still could. happen, presumably. Yes, yeah, if right. the parties are willing to do that. So, yeah. so the city hasn't opted out, so because the city hasn't opted out, everything is still on the table, the district is formed, and then there could be a negotiation and then a Tabor vote. Correct. The following November, which would then decide how to fund any transfer of properties, so there would still be the possibility of negotiating the the relationship between the city library system and the library district. Correct. The only problem with that is what was noted by Mr. Wallace. Then you're going to the electors and saying, form this library district. We don't really know how this is going to turn out, but go ahead and form it. Well, I mean, I guess it does, you know, I'll, I'll return to this later, but I guess what it does do is ask if the will of the voters within this circle, which includes a whole bunch of Boulder voters, is that they want a district to happen. Yes. And so it, it the, the formation question, it doesn't specify, I mean, the Tabor question is what's going to specify the dollars and cents and, the, you know, all the arrangements will have been made and how much are my taxes going to increase. And that's why you have a Tabor vote is because taxes will increase. So it seems to me that there is a pathway there 
which still allows the city to negotiate the agreement between the library properties of the city and the district, which would then result in a Tabor vote. Yes, there's nothing in the statutes that would prevent what you're saying. Okay. I've never seen that done, but it I'm could, not it suggesting could it necessarily. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand what the the this kind of, as David Gear described it, the blunt instrument of <clears throat> the the statute as it's written allows us to do or not to. Thank you, mm -hmm. Bob. So I want to come back to the, the discussion you had with Mark because you you indicated that the the disadvantage of of submitting. A question to the voters before you negotiated an IDA, IGA was that the voters wouldn't know all the terms, right? Correct. And so they'd be asked the question, do you want to form a district without necessarily knowing the tax amount or what the terms are? But if we form it by resolution, it, don't we have exactly that same problem? It's just a different number of people, right? We have, Instead of having 30,000 people who don't have information, we have nine people who don't have information, and we're still making the same decision without, without an IGA having been negotiated or the Tabor amount known, and all that all that information that would be really helpful to either nine people or 30,000 people is going to be missing in both instances. Is that correct? Yes, but um, understand that when you form the district by resolution, all you're really doing is creating the entity, the board. So it's a shell. How is that different if there is a community vote without a Tabor vote? Um, if, if they if they vote to form a district and that's the only question, isn't that the same thing? That would be the same thing. Okay, so it's it's thirty thousand people without information or nine people without information, yes. but it, it's the same problem though, isn't it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can I follow up on that, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'll follow up, and then um, I've got Junie, and then Mirabai, and then Aaron. <clears throat> Rachel's been in the line for. Oh, I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> I'll put Rachel ahead of Aaron. Please. I'll wait on my follow up. Thank you. Um, Junie. Thank you. I hear two different things from what Sam said and what you said previously before Sam went and explained. Because you mentioned that the district could be created by the county if the city opts out, meaning that we're having this discussion here. If we decide we won't go at it by resolution, someone can bring a petition, and have the city do it. So that means that we've, we've already opted out because we've decided that we're not going to participate in the process. Am I correct? Um, there's actually a formal opt-out that takes place if there's a petition. So as David said, um, when the petition is delivered, it has to have a boundary drawing. So that boundary presumably would include Boulder. Um, at that point, before the county moves that to an election or forms it by resolution, there's a period of time in which the city can say, we don't want to be part of it. Now, typically what would happen, again, this hasn't happened in my experience, but if you did that, the district would probably not be formed because it's not going to have a tax base. So does that mean this discussion we're having, there's two, three opportunities. There's the opportunity of doing it by the city or the county, or going to the electors, to the voters? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, if, if the boundaries are going to go outside of the city, it needs to go to the county. Okay. And also, I wanted to ask a question about the transfer of assets. What would be the challenges if we had the county going forward with doing it instead of the city? Yeah. Uh, the county doesn't have any library assets. So the idea here would be to have the city library assets move to the library district. So there is nothing that the county could really provide except money. Can I uh, ask a follow-up of Kim? So, so would you mind just explaining in your experience how the issue of transferring assets are most commonly dealt with? Mm -hmm. Um, what we've done in every situation is go ahead and draft an IGA, uh, assuming what people want, and then just noting in there all of the negotiation points. That would then come to you as the city council, and you would change the terms however you want. And again, it's an, it's an agreement between two parties, so if you don't sign off on it, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so it becomes a negotiation. Uh, everyone I've done has gone much more quickly than I expected. Uh, and like I said earlier, I've always worried about at some point somebody's going to say, 
we're not going to give you these buildings or we're not going to lease them to, to you, which is okay, then the library district has to find another way to provide the libraries. Um, but it's just never happened because everyone seems to be on board to, to make the libraries better for everyone. Right now we have a situation um, in Southwest La Plata down by Durango. So we had the district formed and funded this last November. The libraries are in the schools. So the school district and the county were the forming entities, but we didn't get the boundaries figured out until too late for the county assessor to draw the maps so that we could collect our taxes this year. So we're working on an IGA right now where the school district is going to go ahead and fund the libraries as it always has through 2020. Then 2021, the library district will get its first tax funding and we'll have an arrangement where the library district will begin paying back the school district for the 2020 expenses. So there's lots of flexibility once you have the two entities that can talk to each other and negotiate the IGA. Before I call on Mirabai, I wanted to just follow up on the question that David asked. Um, you mentioned that you draft an IGA and then you give it to the parties and then they start negotiating. So it's not, I had envisioned until then that the parties came to the table and hashed it out. It doesn't quite work that way. It's like you're passing paper around and people it, are marking it up. It, and yeah, you know, it, it could work that way, but it would be so hard <laughs> to try to have two, two boards negotiating with one another. So there's certainly nothing wrong with doing that, but it just, in my experience, it's simpler to have an outline of, here's what we're gonna do, and then you negotiate the deal points along the way and, and you're done. I can Thank can you. I follow um, up on that as well? Do you please. Mind? Sorry, I'll give you, I'll let you in just a second. But the, <clears throat> so to the, so the IGA is, that's something that then doesn't go into effect until we sign it. Correct. Correct. And so we would approve that as a body, yes. right? Yes. So I guess, Bob, to your earlier point in terms of we would, we might form a district without knowing everything, but we would still have to approve the details. So we actually would have, I believe, full knowledge before we finalize that mm -hmm. IGA. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind, I'm hearing in your questions, um, not confusion, but you really have to keep in mind that once the library district board is formed, it's a separate government. So now if it wants to do something, it needs to talk to you and you have to agree. And if you don't agree, it's not going to happen. So it's separate, you're separate, you're two separate entities negotiating a contract. And if someone doesn't agree with a the point, then that's not going to work that way. I'm not confused because I thought the IGA happened. Aaron, you've now confused me with your question and, and your, your answer, Kim, which I think was inconsistent with your answer to my question. Is the IGA negotiated before or after the district is formed by resolution? It would be, it would be negotiated after the sure. district is right. formed after by resolution. Okay. So you would form a resolution without knowing the IGA terms. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I was I, I acknowledge that. I'm just saying, but we would have to approve the IGA before it could go into effect. So that while we might find form the district without the knowledge, it couldn't go forward without our then subsequent approval. Yeah. Of and, the IGA. and that would be true in every instance. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And Mr. Yates, typically we would put in the resolute the formation resolution um, that you are forming it by resolution. And if the IGA and or the funding doesn't occur within a certain amount of time, it's dissolved. Mirabai. I'm jumping back to what um, some of the stuff Sam was talking about, and I think you've kind of answered it, but for the way my brain operates, I'm just confirming here. So if the county were to go create a district and we opt out, you've, you said something about overlaying, so Boulder City has our library and now the county has one. Two options here. Are the city residents getting doubly taxed or is the county going to fall apart because they don't have a tax base and so therefore it wouldn't move forward? The no. latter. So that's what I thought. Um, and then the second question was, let's say the county creates the district, city opts in. <coughs> is there, I just want to clarify this one to make sure I understand, is there a second vote for city county residents 
to vote on the increase of taxes that they will be paying to fund the district. There that's will a be vote. a vote. So that's a second vote. Whether it's a second vote, it, it could happen in the same election, but yes, it's two votes. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Rachel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow up a little bit or in, invert Mark's question. He asked what can go wrong. I'm curious how we tee it up to best go smoothly and right. And as a voter, um, I, I think I understand your concern, Bob, about doing a resolution without having the IGA. Um, but at least we would be doing the resolution then entering quickly into an IGA and then getting that information in front of the voters. So nobody would be really taking any big steps without knowing the numbers. But I don't know that I'm as just myself as a voter, if I would be excited to have this really blank cryptic question, do you want a district? And then a year later, do you want to fund the district? That just seems a bit clunky and I don't really know what I'm voting for in the first one. So, and then the second one, I might think I just, I just did that. Like, why is this back in front of me? So I'm wondering how do you, how is it most clean for voters and most likely to go smoothly yeah. in your opinion? Yeah, um, I have a firm opinion on that. <laughs> um, over the years, the, the smoothest thing, and I, I think this is for you to decide, but I think it's for the benefit of everybody when the district is formed by resolution. The first reason is if, if the county approves a petition, your choice now is to opt out or stay in. If you decide to form by resolution, the county would, will be fine with that. Um, counties are strong on library districts and it doesn't, it barely affects them. Um, what we've done in the past is have them pass a resolution and have the city pass a resolution and they're mutually dependent on one another. Within that resolution, you can include things like if the library district doesn't obtain funding or doesn't enter into an IGA within so many years, it's dissolved, and now you have the entity in existence. Again, it's a shell, but you can work out with it all of the details so that when you go to a vote, the voters know what's going on and, and why you've chosen this option. And typically in that first resolution where you form it, you would also say, we think this should go to the voters, but you need to know what you're voting on, so we're forming the entity and if you vote against the funding, it'll just go away. Thank you. And then do you have to specifically in the in the Tabor vote exclude a vote for yes or no on the district? Like does the Tabor have to, or, or can the vote say, would you like a district and, and are you saying yes to this? It, it, that's actually kind of a, 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 believe it or not, a bond attorney's question. I think you have to have two questions. Okay, so you'd, you'd wanna either have two or just the one that's only for the Tabor? Yes. Okay. Aaron. Um, Mark, and then Adam. Thank you. Unlike Bob and Aaron, I am delighted to confess to my confusion. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, and I want to build on, on something that, that um, Rachel said as well. If, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, by resolution, we can build in whatever contingencies we desire in terms of approval of an IGA, proper funding. Are there any other contingencies that, that would normally be built into the um, prob Probably not, because your IGA is the thing you're going to be most worried about. And then we can move from, from that to the negotiation of the IGA, and ultimately from that to a vote with two questions asking the voters to approve formation and to approve the funding. At that point, you'd only have one question, and it would be the funding question, because you've already formed the entity by your resolution. But the entity is subject to the funding. It, um, so it, it, its dissolution is subject to the funding. So it's formed as a shell, and then if it's not funded, your, resolu your, your formation resolution says it goes away. Are we prohibited from at the point where we have a negotiated IGA asking the people of Boulder whether they like the concept? It no. may not be a formal Tabor vote, but 
at, at some point we ought to be bringing them into this conversation. Yeah, you're, you're certainly not prohibited from doing that, but, but at that point it would be part of a political campaign to say, here's what's going to happen if you vote yes for the funding, mm -hmm. and here's what's going to happen if you vote no. If you vote no, the library district is as though it never existed. Mm -hmm. If you vote yes, the terms of this IGA will be implemented and it'll carry on from there. Okay, thank you. Quick question regarding the resolution path. Since the formation of the board is one of the first things you do, can you set rules for forming the board prior to actually forming the board? The rules for forming the initial board are in the statutes. Okay. Um, and this is one of the reasons I think you want to form by resolution, because remember, the petition is in the county's hands. The establishing entities are the ones that choose the library district board. In that case, it's the county. If they agree to form by resolution and you agree to form by, to, to join in with them to form by resolution, now you can set up a system where you're choosing the library district trustees, they're called, not directors, um, or you're doing that in conjunction with the county. Most of our library districts where there was a city uh, being that had a library that was formed in this way, the city ends up doing all the appointments. So I understand that much, but you can't make additional rules in advance of assigning the first board? Well, I, I'm not sure what kind of rules you're like, thinking say of. Say a but, residency rule for a couple of the seats, something along those lines. Yeah, um, so if you're doing the appointment, you only choose residents. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get that, but can you then make those rules as part of the IGA or? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, in fact, you're required to come up with some rules in the IGA. Um, one of the issues with a, a, a residency, you, you could certainly have a residency requirement, but oftentimes entities want to have a, um, an area. You've got to have some a representative from here and a representative from here. There's nothing that authorizes that in the statute, but um, we have written into IGAs that you will, that the library district will strive to have a representative from each of these areas. Gotcha. And it sounds like this is just a statement on a question, but the, the vote for funding really is the vote for the district, period, like at the end of the day. Like, I don't know how much more we have to discuss that. <laughs> Well, I, I have a follow-up question to yours before um, I call on Bob and then <clears throat> Sam, um, which has the, to your question about um, the rules of the board, is if the city goes in on the resolution with the county, um, is the initial, you said the initial board is ruled by statute. Right. Um, as part of the IGA, can the things like the size of the board and the number of representatives from in-city and out-of-city be part of the IGA? The size of the board is either five or seven. That's set by statute. Um, I've never thought about whether you could say you have to have you know three people from the city and two from the county. Uh, and the reason that I've never had to deal with it is because generally the county doesn't care. Okay. You know, once once they're, the library district is established, the library district board ends up really working hard to get people on the board that are library supporters and then presenting them to whoever is going to do the um, the appointments. And, and the appointments, the is that part of the, who who the appointing body is? Is that part of the IGA? No. That would be part of the formation resolution. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was saying. If if the petition goes to the county and the county forms, the county would now be the establishing entity with the authority to appoint the board, where if you did a, a joint resolution with the county and the city to form the entity, within that resolution you could agree that the, um, you would agree that the city is going to be part of that appointment process. So the statute says that the establishing entities do the appointment. So in this case, it would be um, the city and the county, and and you're saying that the county generally doesn't 
care. Right. So it would be mostly the city then. Yes. And then after the district is established, then does the board become a self-perpetuating board? It's self-perpetuating, but the appointments are approved by the establishing entities. Which in, in perpetuity, it would be the city and the county. Yes. Thank you. Um, Bob. Kim, um, you know, we've been struggling a little bit with this question of what the the deal is, I guess I'll call it, what the terms are, um, whether nine people or 12 people, that would be nine council and three county commissioners, was which we have here, or 30,000 people decide that some, some combination of that has to decide either, either an election or through some sort of joint resolution. Um, I assume, um, getting back to Aaron's point about the IGA, that because these are the city assets, the city is going to have certain terms, non-negotiables, is going to say, we're going to, we, we're going to require the following things, right? Yes. I mean, the IGA hasn't been negotiated yet, but since there are assets, we can kind of say, these are the things we're going to agree to, and these are the things we're not going to agree to. So that could be enunciated either in an establishing resolution or to the voters if we took this establishing question to the voters. In other words, we could say, dear voters, you want a district, and by the way, here are the terms. We haven't negotiated an IGA because there's no other side to the table, but we're just telling you because these are our assets, these are the these are the terms. It's going to be leased property, and it's going to be X number of mills, and it's going to be this and this and this. We could basically say, under these terms, would you, ex would you form a library district? Right. Yes. Okay. So it, it, either way, it becomes part of your political campaign. Um, we, we did have a situation in Aurora where um, the city didn't want to do an agreement mm -hmm. and the voters shot everything down because they didn't, I don't want to say it this way, but I have to, <laughs> they didn't trust the city to, to abide by what they thought was going to happen. Can you elaborate on this so. a little bit more? Because that sounds intriguing. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just opened a new. No, I think new, I better not. <laughs> no, no. So, so the city, the city established some terms. Is that right? Correct. The city established some terms, and then the establishment vote went to the voters. Yes. And the voters voted it down. Voted it down. Okay, because they didn't like the terms that the city had had suggested, or, or they didn't think the city was going to follow through on those terms? The latter. Okay, thanks. And then what happened? That was it. It's still a city library, and um, it's woefully underfunded, sadly. Let's see. I had Sam after Bob, and then Mark. So I'd like to go back to <clears throat> um, and make sure I understood. So I had always thought this resolution was going to be a city resolution saying we're willing to do this, but it sounds like it's a mutual resolution. So the city and the county each have the same resolution and the terms are the same and they both execute this resolution together. They jointly execute it. Um, and then the establishing entities determine the appropriate boundaries. So in that resolution, the boundaries are determined by the city and the county. Correct. Establishing it by resolution. Yes. And then, then we, the establishing entities, appoint <coughs> the board. Yes. So if we do this by resolution, the city and county appoint the board. Yes. So can we, in that establishing resolution, dictate that the city appoints all the board members? Yes. Okay, so that's key because you said, you said that once and you said very quietly and I thought I heard it and then you said it kind of again, but then you said the county doesn't care. You answered. I, to, I to, said that. Well, well I no, you repeated that, what yeah. he said. He said generally the county doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> and so what that means to me is, well, we wouldn't just leave it that way, you know, that it's going to be joint city and county and that's 12 people and how's that going to work? And so we could say, because these are city assets that are going to go to the library district, that we want to be able to appoint the board members. Um, and then going forward, appointments or approval, so if the board's going to appoint the new board members, the city council could approve the appointment of those board members so we could agree to, with the county that because these are mostly city assets that are going to be 
given and because presumably our voters would still like some say over how those assets are going to be used, that a way that our voters can work through the council to have a say about the operation of the district is through the city council in this joint resolution that we're going to sign, it can dictate that the city council will be the body that approves appointments to the district board. Is that correct? Yes, um, but let me just clarify. What the law says is that the establishing entities <coughs> appoint the board. How, how does it so? So, we, so, so if you are, if you and the county are the establishing entities, you can figure out the process by which you're going to do the appointments. So you can certainly agree on something that gives the city really control. Um, my comment about the counties is that um, most of the entities we have have this county overlay um, and the county commissioners really don't participate. Uh, some of them are just county libraries, so they, they very much participate, but generally that's not so. They just want somebody to say, Here's the people we want on the board, and they say, good deal, and it's done. Yeah, it just makes me uncomfortable that we w would need a process. I mean, whether it was we all vote equally, you know, the nine city council members and the three county commissioners to approve or not approve, we vote as a body, or if it's just the city council because we have a lot more skin in the game, really, than the county does, it seems like we would want to and are able to. So it says the appoint the establishing entities, but the establishing entities presumably can decide whether they want to participate or not, each of their own. Yeah. Because I think this is a key point as far as how the folks who have built this library over time and who, in fact, it's going to be within the boundaries for the foreseeable future, all facilities will be. And so it, it seems to me like it was key to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want us to make a decision and have the wrong information. Yes. But it seems like this joint resolution has some flexibility in it. We have to do five or seven, but the joint resolution and the IGA are the two points where there is some structure that can be negotiated and established and then operated under yes. each of those. Yes. Okay. And um, to clarify something you said right at the beginning of your comment or your question, um, when we formed Fort Collins, we had the county commissioners adopt a resolution as they needed to because it was going outside of the city. And then we had the city adopt a resolution. Rather than those being a joint resolution or the same resolution, the county resolution basically said, we're forming the entity, and upon approval of a resolution by the city, it's done. And that way, the city could do whatever it needed to in its resolution, and the county's approval was effective as soon as the city's resolution was effective. And it included the appointment. So, so what I've described is a, a method of appointment that would be primarily focused on the city council approving appointments to the board. And if the county wrote that blank check, so Larimer County wrote a blank check to the city of Fort Collins on the governance structure of the appointment of the board. Yes. And so when the city council of Fort Collins wrote whatever they wrote, that became automatically approved. Correct. Okay, thank you. Just, and, um yeah, we have Junie and then Marker. Did you have a colloquy? Just a quick follow up. So, okay, go ahead. So, any anyway. So, if we if we we could quite conceivably uh, communicate with the county commissioners and set up a similar structure if they're willing, right? So, just take that same kind of approach. And then just uh, just for clarity, um, that process that Sam described would then <clears throat> be in perpetuity the process by which the partially self-perpetuating board would get approved. Yes. Okay. Just to make sure that we're crystal clear, because that answer is important to me. So any board appointment made by the board, so presumably the board of seven, say, somebody terms out or resigns for some reason, the remaining board members would appoint the replacement 
subject to approval by the establishing entities. And if the establishing entities had said city council will make the approval, then any future board member appointed by the district board would need to be approved by the city council. Correct. Okay, thank you. And that process can require that the city take over the entire process. So it doesn't have to come from the library board. Um, we like to set it up so that the library board does the initial interviews and lines up people to send to the establishing entity for approval just because that way you get library people that are really interested in libraries, but it doesn't have to be that way. So your suggestion, if I heard your, what, what is commonly done, is that when library boards are filling a vacancy on their board, the, the <clears throat> districts, they make a nomination to the establishing entity board, which could be the city council in this yes. case, and the city council approves or doesn't, or they, they select, if they nominate three for one seat, the city council can then select one of the three for that vacancy. Correct. Okay, thank you. Can I follow up again? Yeah, please, Sorry Aaron. And then up. after Aaron, we'll have, we have Junie and then Mark. And the, and the final form of how that whole governance structure would work would be determined by the IGA, is that correct? A portion of it would be in the IGA, but most of setting that structure would be in the resolution. Okay, the so you, get, you do most of it in the resolution and then tie a bow on it in the IGA. Okay. So the, the resolution kind of creates the DNA for the library district, yep. and this is how it exists, so you lock that in permanently. Thank you. I I have three questions for you, because we're talking, we're still talking about establishing entity, and I wanted to hear from you whether you think this is something that the. Right now, you're speaking with us when it comes to establishing, but is this is this something that the city commissioners even considering? Yes. The county commissioners? Yes. Um, the, they, uh, if they're presented with a petition or a request, they will. I don't know if they've, to what extent they've been approached so far. Okay. Um, again, every board of county commissioners I've ever worked for, with was just, they're on board. It's done. So that means if we decide, let's say we don't make any decisions today, that means everything just remains in limbo, basically. Unless the county commissioners are pushed to do something. Okay, and we don't know whether they will. No. Okay. Um, and, and the way to think about this is, uh, or I should have probably defined this earlier, establishing entities can be any government mm -hmm. or several working together. So a school district can be a, a establishing entity, a county, a municipality. Yeah, and I think as well my question to you, because again, you mentioned earlier, without a resolution, what is the chances, if we were to go to the voters, what are the chances of it passing? And from what I'm hearing from you, unlikely. Um, we have passed them. Mm -hmm. it, it's just so much more difficult because, again, nobody really knows what you're voting on yeah. other than some funding and something to do with libraries. So in my belief, it's much better to get all of that pinned down or at least close to pinned down ahead of time so that you know what's going on, you know how the appointments are going to go, the county knows, the library board knows what's going to happen. And then you also have a library district board at that point who can go out and promote and run the election. Mm -hmm. So otherwise it's going to be run by the establishing entities mm -hmm. um, and the people with the most invested are those library board people. And also, when, when it comes to the IGA, if, <clears throat> if we decide to do it by resolution, we'll have a greater opportunity to control how it is formed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Junie, just as a reminder, there's nine of us and three of them. <laughs> 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 just saying. <laughs> um, so, um, Mark and then Rachel. I'm going to pass Sam's question answered mine. Okay, great. R Rachel? Do we have a list of questions that we're answering tonight? Could we flash those up so that I know if I have other questions? Did that yeah, make I sense? I think we're still going through um, Katie's presentation, still correct? Still got some. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and the primary purpose is really to let you 
cross-examine Kim and learn what you need to learn about um, district formation and, you know, kind of somebody who has real-world experience in f forming districts? Oh, Bob. <laughs> it's my turn. I'm going to continue the cross-examination of Kim. Uh, Kim, um, are the are the boundary if if a district is formed by resolution in response to a petition, are the boundaries established by the petitioners or by the resolution parties? They should be established by the petition. So, the, so the petition establishes the boundaries, and the resolution parties basically accept those boundaries or don't pass the resolution. They, they can't change those. Um, <laughs> they do get changed. Strictly what the statute says is the petition sets forth what the boundaries are to be, and then the petition is approved or not approved. But almost everyone I've been in, there's been some negotiation for various reasons. Uh, under under threat of opt-out. In other words, if you don't change the boundaries, we're going to just opt-out? Yeah. Yeah, okay, got it. So that leads me to a second question. What's the opt-out time frame? In other words, petition is dropped on day zero. Um, how quickly does, from day zero, does the city have to opt out? There's a window of time that's 30 days long, and it's the 30 days before the county commissioners take action on the measure that will put it on the ballot. How do we know when they're going to do that? Well, the first thing that they have to do, once once a petition is submitted, yeah. um, and I believe that the, the, the common practice is that the notice is provided with the petition, the county immediately gives notice to the city that a petition has been submitted. So does so that, that usually start happens the same day or the next day? Okay, I didn't quite follow the thirty days because it was a, is it before or an after thirty days? So the petition is is delivered and petition notice or whatever is delivered to the county on day zero. When must the city decide to opt out or not opt out? It's thirty days. So what the statute says is that the the petitioner committee has to submit their petition at least 90 days before a Tabor election. Got that part. So um, the county commissioners, typically, you're going to put that on the ballot sometime in the month of August. And what, whatever date they set for considering that item, subtract 30 days, and it has to be before that. Yeah. It's not the most. Before uh, 30 days before a date that they set, which we don't know about ahead of time. It's not a model of clarity, but yeah. they have to give you notice. Yeah. They who? The county? Has the to county commissioners. The county has to give us notice that we're going to set the election on a certain day, and that's going to be at least 30 days in the, to the future. Yes, and you have this time period to opt out. So yeah. they have to give so us 60 days notice then, right? If let's say they're going to, they told us on August one we're going to decide on the on the ballot question. No, it would be the same thirty days. So, so we, we have, have the to month give of July. You notice that so, they're going to address so, it and that you have thirty days to opt out. Okay, so sometime in June they'd have to tell us August one's the magic date, the, our, our decision date, and then we'd have the month of July to opt out. Is that correct? Yeah, and um, what what David's saying is true. I think every one we've ever done that notice comes out with the notice that a petition has been filed. So there's, it's not a, it's not a fixed period of time. It uh -huh. is in the way the statute's written, but really, if you opt out early, you're out. It's um, okay. I don't understand, but we'll just I, I know it a, sounds silly, but yeah. the way the statute reads, you've got to do it during this 30-day period. Yeah. But in truth, that 30-day period is really the notice period. So they have to give you at least 30 days notice that you they, have. The county has to down. give the city 30 days notice. Yeah. And then during that 30-day, from so when they deliver notice, we'll call that day zero. Yes. Okay. They deliver some notice, and then we have 30 days to decide to opt out or not. Yes. Got it. Okay. Uh, just a quick hypothetical. Um, we establish this, the, uh, the uh, <coughs> taxation is passed, and it turns out to be inadequate 10 years from now. Are we mere passengers on the bus as the uh, library district goes out for additional funding? Do we have any input to that? Um, or if they want to double or triple the, uh, the mill levy, are we just kind of waving at them and going, have at it? Yeah, um, it really becomes a political 
matter at that point. So the library district is on its own and it can go out and try to double its funding, um, whatever it needs to do. And we have, we have no input whatsoever. Other than through the appointment process of the trustees. Okay. You don't. Thank you. Any other questions? Can, can, if, if this is established in the resolution, can, can the establishing entity, let's say it's the city, also remove trustees at will? That's in the statute. And um, what does no. it say? <laughs> you can appoint, but you cannot remove. Yeah, it has to be for cause. Okay. And cause is defined in two ways. Uh, one is within the library trustee's own bylaws. Mm -hmm. But the recent High Plains case we did in the Court of Appeals established that cause as defined in Colorado law Bad behavior. is also. Bad behavior, okay. And um, is the term, that is the term of time that the, someone serves, is that established by statute or is that established by resolution? It's established by statute. Okay, and how long is the Initially, term? and then the rest is by the bylaws. Bylaws which are established by the resolution of the established entity. Could be established by the So resolution. even though you can't r remove a trustee, you could say that all the terms are one year, for example. And, and, and then, yeah. and then you'll, you'll never more than 364 days away from not reappointing somebody. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. You, you, for obvious reasons, you wouldn't want to say that, but you could. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to Katie's presentation now. Thanks, Mary, and hopefully you guys have less questions for me. Um, we, <laughs> they're all great, um, wanted to provide some financial context to the discussion as well. So as you think about formation and options, we wanted to run through kind of um, what the total cost of a library system is, what that means for a property owner and um, the type of revenue that may be raised from a district. So in doing this, there's a few assumptions that I wanted to just get clear. I mean, obviously there's a lot of scenarios, but for the purpose of this analysis, our assumption is that the city of Boulder's dedicated 0.33 mills to the library is eliminated. And then for the purpose of the discussion, we are also using a similar mill rate um, that the library champions are using so that you can hopefully see similar numbers between the two at 3.85. Again, moving target, I do want to say that as um, Tanya mentioned, we have updated the property tax since 2018. You know, we had a reassessed year and we have a different residential rate. So if you do look back at some of those materials, there will be some slight changes to the numbers. But this is the most current. So when we talk about total library um, cost versus budget, it's important to know that um, there's kind of three different pieces to library um, cost. One is the operating expense, which is a budgeted number within the city's general fund. The other is um, facilities, maintenance, or capital expenses. And here what we did was really took a look at historical but also future planned capital needs to get sort of an average of what you might need every year related to facility maintenance and capital, and that's the $3.3 .3 million. And then there's also this piece, if the library to, were to be its own district or even its own fund, there's administrative overhead that um, costs the district or costs the library service. And this is really related to communication service, legal service, finance, um, risk, HR, that is currently provided by the general fund. And so that isn't really included in their budget, per se, when you look at their budget, but it is what we call an indirect cost. So on average, we look at the total cost of a library service to be close to 16 million, which really aligns with some of the materials that the library champions have been estimating at um, just over $16 million. So moving on to kind of the budget piece, it's important to know how current City of Boulder Library Department is funded. Like I said, um, there is the 0.33 mills that generates about $1.5 million. Within this fund, about 80% of that is from the dedicated property tax. This fund also does receive um, some do donations and some grants to comprise that $1.5 million. Um, the remaining portion, or the you know, 80% of the funding is from the general fund. And just as a reminder, the general fund is comprised of sales tax, property tax, kind of other taxes, and then other fees for service. And so I just provided the breakdown so you can see how the general fund portion is allocated in that $7.5 million. 
Um, this is a proposed kind of service boundary map that we showed in 2018, the red line being the city of Boulder. Um, and then the little dots are actually patron counts, again, 2018. But we estimate that um, we capture about 63 to 65% of patrons within the red boundary or the city limits. When you expand out to the black boundaries, which is the proposed boundary line for the district, you capture um, upwards of 85% of the patrons um, within that black line. I ask a quick question. What's your definition of patron? Is that a, somebody who has been issued a library card at some point in, in the past? Uh, there could be some other dots. So each of the gray dots um, is a house. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, David Farnan, Library and Arts Director. The, the gray dots actually represent households with a library card. So in some, if you counted them up, it wouldn't come to whatever the total is because uh, some addresses map to a P.O. box, some map to a, a mobile home park. That kind of the library cards never expire. In other words, if somebody in Netherlands came down one day, got a library card, and 10 years oh, later... We oh, clear the database oh, every year. So if you haven't used your library card in three years, you're automatically kicked out. So these are these are people who have... These are active, what we refer to as active library card users. That was Great. data from 2018 or late 2017, I think. So we get about 13,000 new card holders per year. We probably drop around eight to 9,000 card holders per year, people who've either left town or university students who are no longer active, and so we just delete their cards. Yep. Yeah, Rachel. Um, well, whilst you're there, so if I look at like the top left and then the bottom left of the black, there's a lot of empty, no user space and a lot of of yeah, land so there. It, Why did we include all of that? Yeah, um, well, there were a lot of people who were involved in making this map, and the critical thing was that um, the county told us that we had to draw the map along voting precincts. And so some of the voting precincts that you see to the west don't have a lot of, that really is empty space. There's nobody living there. There's, it could be open space, um, but it aligns with, in some cases, very large and um, oddly shaped voting precincts. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so um, moving on, we wanted to talk about kind of the three different service Pardon me, Katie? area. Katie, yeah. can we go back to the previous yeah. slide? I just wanted to understand, so the black is the proposed district boundary? Yep. What's the green? Um, sorry, that is the Boulder Valley comp plan boundaries. Um, it's difficult because these don't fall within voting precinct lines, so it's hard to kind of say how many voters it captures, so that's why we were really focused on both City of Boulder and then the outside extended area. All right, thank you. Yep. So that then translates to this next slide that has the three different service area lines. Um, again, updated assessed values. When you look at this, we want to note here that we're showing, again, the assessed value, which is the actual value of property um, multiplied by the assessment rate. And so while the assessed value is roughly 50-50 in a lot of these instances, the actual value on residential property is you know, about four times as high because of the um, different assessment rates within the state of Colorado. So you can see as you move uh, boundary limits, the revenue grows. Um, and so depending on, again, where the boundaries occur, revenue generated by 3.85 mills could range somewhere between 16 and $20 million. Quick question. Yep. <clears throat> um, so 80%, so the expanded service area being the proposed mm -hmm. district boundaries and city of Boulder city limits. So 80% of the valuation is in the city of Boulder city limits, but only 65% of the people served. Mm -hmm. Just making sure that we have those things separated. So two thirds of the people served are within the boundaries, but 80% of the valuation is within the boundaries. Thank you. All right, so what this means then for property tax or property owners, if you assume a 3.85 mil rate on an $850,000 home, which is about the average within the city of Boulder limits, the um, increase to your property tax bill would be $234. On a commercial property, it's much higher at um, you know, $949 a year. 
Again, backing out that 0.33 mills, you'll see that there'll be a small um, decrease both to um, residential and commercial, so $20 and 82 respectively. That would only go to the city of Boulder residents, to be clear. And then depending on the, again, the area, service area that we look at, the revenue generated can range um, between eight, 16 and $20 million. Great. Um, I would like to bookmark for later, so not tonight, not to answer. I mean, it looks like one figure merit that you could use is dollars per um, library patron served mm -hmm. and revenue dollars per library patron served. And it looks like that's different inside and outside the city limit. I'd just be curious to know that number later. Sure. And another quick question. Is the entire difference between the $234 and the $949 the Gallagher Amendment? That's correct. So residential is assessed at 7.15% and uh, commercial at 29%. That is a stark difference. I yes, didn't it realize is. it was quite so high. Yep. Mark, did you? Um, do we know how many commercial um, operations we have in Boulder? that are above 850,000? I don't have that off the top of I mean, my that, head, that, but I would imagine a lot. That number could get very substantial, could it not, as if you get to one and a half million, two million, three million for a commercial business? That, that number That's starts correct. to get uh, interestingly large. We can provide that breakdown. Okay. Another uh, data request. Could you, um, I know you're going to have to make a few assumptions to get here, but this would be really, really helpful mm -hmm. because we're talking about the value of the building, but of course many of our commercial establishments are tenants mm -hmm. who pay property tax on a pass-through basis, triple net from their landlord. Could you um, maybe do a back the envelope, and, and Yvette could probably help you with this because they're doing a retail study and they know mm -hmm. how much average rents are and average um, tax pass-throughs are and so on and so forth. Could you reflect that $949 as a, as a percentage increase? Obviously, you have to use some averages, and maybe different parts of town have different. But just you know, are we talking about a a one percent increase on the average sure. tenant, or a three percent? You know, are they paying twelve dollars in tax and now they're going to pay fourteen dollars a foot in tax? Mm -hmm. what, something like that. Yeah. Well, however you want to portray it. But getting back to Mark's point, like so, we can understand what does that yep. mean to uh, to a typical um, retail or a commercial tenant. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've um, showed this chart too, but wanted to um, highlight if you add in 3.85 mills, but back out the city's 0.33, kind of where does Boulder stand? And so you'll notice on the third to the left is Boulder as it is currently, and so our total mill rate, the orange being kind of more of our county or school district mill rates, and then the blue being what we're calling municipal services. So it could either be in the form of a district or the city. Um, Boulder ranks about third in our comparable cities. If you um, do a library district at 3.85 or, you know, even increase it within our own city uh, budget, it moves kind of in between now Louisville and Fort Collins. Um, and then again, backing out the county because we don't have a lot of control over those ones. Um, it ranks about um, third lowest for municipal types of service up to the fifth lowest. So... So I have a request here <clears throat> um, as we go forward and look. Could you rank these as opposed to total mills, just take out the school district sure. and just look at the municipal services um, piece? And what's our mill levy cap? I'm trying to remember. 13 mills by charter. I'm sorry. Um, 13 mills. Sorry. So we're at 11 point. We're at essentially 12 mills now. Mm -hmm. So our cap is 13. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so just a follow-up question. So this increase from, call it, use run numbers 12 to 15 and a half would be about a 30% increase. Is that right? Am I, am I math correctly? I think your math in your head's quicker than mine, but probably. Okay. Roughly 30%. Yeah. Okay. And that would require a charter change. It would not if it's a district. If we decide to fund, you know, if we put anything on the ballot that pushes us up above. 
13 it would require. And I know you're going to show us sales tax in a second, but when you um, come back on March 17th, can you blend those two together to talk about total tax burden? Again, you'll have to make some assumptions about average family spend, but I think you've done that for us before, mm -hmm. because in some instances we're like, you know, third place on property right. tax, another place we're like on second place on sales tax, but when you slam them together, we're kind of like in first place mm -hmm. for total tax burden. If you could do a total tax burden, burden yep. we'd make them we whatever assumptions of, yeah. you want, yeah. that'd be great. Thanks. We can think of a way to do that. So kind of to add to that, um, last week for the budget strategy meeting, you provided um, a great report um, that broke out um, different state taxes by um, income levels. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to do something like that for just the city of Boulder? Yeah, let me think about how we could do something like that. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So before you go spend all the money in one place, um, just wanted to remind um, council members of conversations that we had last April. So again, um, depending on a library district structure, um, the general fund savings or you know excess kind of or um, capacity is about seven million or seven and a half million dollars. I think you heard Kim mention that um, there are choices and uh, for example, Poudre Valley pays for the administrative overhead. So if you kept all of the same systems, we used what our you know administrative cost was that you saw in the earlier pie charts of 3.4 could be potential revenue either in the short term or as an ongoing um, concept. And then just, you know, we, we do know that we have identified needs that don't have funding sources right now that um, council has said our priorities that have come out of master plans. So just wanted to put that little plug in there as you're thinking about potential options. So um, I'm just trying to track the math here. We heard that the cost of the city of operating the library, including the capital and the overhead was in the 15.5 million. The total cost of a library, our budget doesn't reflect that because we're not paying for overhead. Well, who pays? Hold it. I'm, I'm totally confused. I'm going to go back to the slide so mm -hmm. that I can reference it correctly. It is slide nine. Yep. So slide nine, 15.8 million. Mm -hmm. It's cost to the city to operate the library. Correct. Um, on any given year, right? So this year we had a higher capital budget. But again, the, the administrative overhead isn't charged to the library. It's just absorbed within our general fund. However, that's fine. Yeah. But if we were no longer doing anything for the library itself, the library mm -hmm. is now, it's doing its own, the district is doing mm -hmm. the capital. Mm -hmm expenses and maintenance, doing operating expenses, and it would have that overhead, but we wouldn't. We likely still would. There isn't a one-for-one -one correlation that if they don't, if we don't provide their HR service, we're not going to necessarily eliminate two of the staff that Cut it in half. Charged. I mean, say that it, we only save half of that because of economies of scale. That still looks to me like 12 plus 1.5, so 13 and a half million would be the savings. So I'm just trying to track. Sure. Because you said yeah. seven and a half plus we might make some money if they paid us to do stuff, but it looks to me like leaving any potential future payments out, the savings should be more in the $13 million range. I think this is a good minimum, and I want to be conservative that we're not banking on money we don't have yet, especially given that the, the 15 included a 0.33 mil that goes away that we would not have the, that revenue capacity then. That's about a million and a half right there. A million and a half right there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, and to drill into the, the administrative overhead services, so one potential outcome, correct me if I'm wrong here, would be that um, the city continues doing all of the administrative overhead, things like HR, mm -hmm you know, the, those kind of IT, that kind of stuff, right? So things that are currently kind of buried in the city budget and spread across the entire organization. So that one potential outcome would be that the city still provides all of those services. We don't, um, the costs don't change, but we actually receive some revenue from the district to compensate us for providing those services. Correct. Right, so that, um, so the 7.5 million savings, does that include that additional revenue? No. Or so that, 
the, the next line. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just clarifying. So the the 7.5 savings would be kind of stuff we wouldn't be spending anymore on the library that we could potentially use for other things. And then that three and a half million that they might pay us if we went that route would then be additional revenue we could use for other things. That's correct. So the seven and a half translates to what the general fund portion is right now as a conservative number. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, just kind of continuing on this strain. So um, you showed us a slide that says uh, the city's all in cost of the library is about $16 million. Right, and I know those mm -hmm. taxpayers are kicking in 16, however you mm -hmm. budget or mm -hmm. allocate mm -hmm. it, it's costing the taxpayers $16 million to run our library. And I think you showed us uh, using a 3.85 mil levy that just folks in the city boundaries, just for a second, mm -hmm. that that would generate about $16 million. That's correct. Maybe that's a coincidence, maybe that's not. And, <laughs> and so I get the fact that if we expand our service boundaries and tax those people who are not being taxed, it could be as much as 18 or $20 million, mm -hmm. which is kind of the gravy. But it does kind of beg the question of like, so what's happening here? In other words, the taxpayers are paying $16 million and they're gonna get a 3.85 mil levy increase, assuming we don't do any de decreases, and the budget for the library is still gonna be $16 million, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, presumably it's gonna cost the library district this roughly yeah. the same amount to operate a library as it costs us, right? They're right. not gonna have like some economy of scale or some magic that causes the library mm -hmm. expenses to be less than what it costs us, right? I don't imagine so. It, okay. When we did this analysis in 2018 with BOM, that did not indicate that the districts. So, so setting US. aside the expansion of the mm -hmm. district, which I, maybe that's the whole purpose here, I'm not too sure. Um, it, it's basically the taxpayers are going to get a tax increase, but they're going to get the same um, funding for the same library buildings as they're getting right now. They're going to get $16 million worth of library every year if if the if the boundaries of the district were mm -hmm. simply the city is that at three eight five is that right? Yeah, and I think that with that three eight five, because what what we can't do right now on a very good scale is the maintenance backlog, and so they will be able to address a lot more of that um, through it. So again, well, help me with that. The, yeah, so the fifteen, <laughs> um, the capital maintenance, and that three point three million dollars. Yeah, can you go back to was, that slide nine that so yeah pulled out was. On average, it does not mean that it's supported year over year. So, right. So, if the district was 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 just the city boundaries again, let's go with that. Mm -hmm. And they generated sixteen million dollars. They could kind of do kind of what we're doing, which is operate the library for nine point one. They pay somebody themselves or us or somebody three point four for overhead, and they would spend three point three million dollars on facilities maintenance capital. Right. Mm -hmm. with and that they 16. would have that more consistently and not um, be up against kind of the. Um, coordination of other funding needs. So that 3.3 doesn't necessarily go every year but to But the conversely, library. they couldn't spend more. Like, if we wanted to spend $7 million next right. year, we could, and right. they couldn't, because they only got $16 million coming in per year. Right. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. forgetting about the, the NIWAT and gun yep. barrel for a second, because maybe that's the goal here, is just to, to pull those people in and get an extra 2 to $4 million for the library. But it seems to me like 16 in, 16 out, it's kind of a wash. Mm -hmm. OK. Can, can I? Yeah, I was actually going to ask David to come up because my understanding on that on that the three point three million that's been allocated on an ad hoc basis, and you haven't gotten that most years, right? Like the last year or two, we've added some additional funding for the library. Yeah, but and we have and we have Nobo coming up this year, so I don't. What is the number? Eight million dollars that are in capital expenses for this year. Uh, I guess. I mean, I I think I also want to just. I, I can't speak entirely for the library champions, but. There's no scenario where the library champions are proposing that a district library be the boundaries that are the city. That was merely something that we did in the master plan to show council what it would cost, and the cost is the same. The burden to the taxpayer of running the library is the same, which I think the Baum study bore out, but the, but the library champions, which is in some reason why we're here tonight, um, has never proposed that it's either limited to the city boundaries, and I think they would say precisely they're against that idea, that the city um, would fund the entire library, which has roughly 30% of its users outside of the city. Yeah, no, I understood that, David. I was just I was just suspending reality for a second. So what it, what it says is the Boulder taxpayers are going to pay more so that we can force Niwot and Gun Barrel folks to pay something. Right. In other words, under the expanded boundary, is going to bring in about twenty million dollars. So the the library will have four million more at its disposal than it does now, assuming that three million dollars is a good number. Um, 
and but but the, but the Boulder taxpayers got to pay more in order to extract that extra money from the county residents. Yeah, we'd have we'd have to go back and look at the data precisely, Bob. But I I think what it adds is. Um, 22% more households and about 20% more value, overall assessed value. I right, think but that's if, what it adds. If, if the only proposition is let's tax Niwot and Gun Barrel, that would be different. But we're saying let's tax Boulder residents a second time and tax Gun Barrel and Niwot. That's, that's the proposition that's on the table. I'm not sure I understand. Well, the proposition is not to tax Gun Barrel and Niwot only. It's to tax Boulder, Gun Barrel, Niwot, yeah? Yes, correct. Okay. For the for the, the 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 map, it's a much larger area than just Gun Barrel. Right, but eighty percent, as Sam pointed out, eighty percent of the tax would be paid by Boulder residents and businesses. I think that's yeah. correct. Okay. If I I think um, potentially though, with that outcome, we would then have other revenue to support other city services, right? So so the the it's not like the the money would go away and be double taxed and not you. I mean, we would have that available, and we could conceivably lower other taxes if we wanted to, um, to reduce the tax burden, or we could improve other cities' yeah, services. But it, yeah, I, I understand that, but it felt like we were, were paying 16 to get 7.5. Uh, that's why I think we were all struggling with that math, which is Boulder, Boulder residents and businesses' taxes will go up in the aggregate by $16 million as part of a larger district. But I think Katie conservatively said, but only count on 7.5. As as the net windfall, so some some eight and a half million dollars went away somewhere. Well, I think that's that's the money we currently pay to support the library that would right. then continue to go to support the library as part of a district, and then there'd be seven to ten million additional dollars that we could spend for other city services. Could you say that again, Aaron? I'm pretty sure I did not track. So so I think if you took the the net additional burden to Boulder taxpayers of. Is it sixteen million dollars? I'm losing a little bit. Is say it's sixteen million dollars that that uh, approximately nine million of that would be the money that Boulder taxpayers are already paying to support the day-to-day -day operating of the library, and then there would be seven to ten million additional dollars to be used that could be used for other city services. So, in other words, if I'm tracking you correctly, the Boulder taxpayers' taxes are going to go up to pay for part of the services they already have and are already paying for, and they're going to continue paying into the city fund, the general fund, which will be used for something else. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a tax increase, and that's what that is saying. However you parse it out, Correct. it's a tax increase, and it's tax increase probably disproportionately on the city of Boulder residents, per, for sure, the businesses. Um, and so that's what I think we need to keep in mind from an equity perspective is the businesses who likely don't use the library very much, their increase is going to be much more than the residential who presumably do use the library. Yes, totally. So I think it's a separate point, but yes. Yeah. And Tanya, did you want to say something? Thanks, Mary. So I just want to jump in here. Um, this is a very valuable conversation um, to help us frame information coming back on March 17th. I think what I'm hearing is give, um, give council more clarity of what that net increase in the budget is and how that aligns to the master plan. That is information we presented last year in the spirit of time we didn't add that, so that will be an easy add. Um, to this conversation, which will include um, um, expansion services to Gun Barrel, NIWAT. It does also um, address significant backlog in our existing facilities in Boulder. So we'll really separate that out within the three levels of the master plan and what that achieves. Thank you, Tanya. And Juni? I appreciate Bob's comment about the rent those commercial, you know, um, who pay rent. I think that's very important when we think of equity. But I think I needed some clarification on the taxes because from what I'm hearing from Bob, he's saying several times that taxes will be doubled. And I think we would need some clarification. What does that really mean? Or is there a phase out time? What does it really mean? Because I'm sure people don't want their taxes to double. So the taxes wouldn't double, and I think Katie showed a chart, So, and then Bob asked the question, I believe that the property tax increase, now it depends upon where you live in the city, it's somewhere between 3 and 4%. 3 and 4% applies across um, 
residential and business interests. Uh, that to, to you, to the city of Boulder, um, that's not, I mean, that's what Katie, I think, is trying to mm -hmm. describe, but I, I don't know what you decide to do with that money, and I don't think that's any part of uh, the champion's proposal either. I'm going to ask my question real quick, which is, and it piggybacks really on, on what David just said. Do we want to look at a corresponding mill reduction, basically? I mean, if we're, we're gaining $16 million and we're already collecting $16 million, do we look at reducing? Plug your ears, Katie, on that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe Tanya, too. But I think it's worth discussing. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the policy decision that you have. And, and again, I would be cautious to say that you'd um, have $16 million that you'd free up. So, I mean, just for for more order of magnitude, right, if you were to reduce the city's mill levy, um, the 0.33, and then make it one mill, right, so another 0.666 for the general fund, that's $2.7 million less annually. And, and what we're trying to say is it totally policy decision. You also have a lot of needs that you're going to have to come to terms with during the budget process as well. So. If you live in Niwot or Gun Barrel now, you're not restricted in any way from the use of our library. Am I not correct? That's correct. So we are assuming people outside of the city will be delighted to pay more for services that they get for free now. I'm, I'm just, that's just a political issue. We're not making issue, any assumptions. I, I, it, it seems a little unrealistic to me. I'm not suggesting it's that we don't go forward, but. So uh, we, we did do a poll last year in March. I would say no longer valid, but the, there was no um, statistically significant difference in the support for those people in unincorporated Boulder County than there was within the city of Boulder. And there was, I mean, interestingly enough, and I wish I could explain it, but the question of businesses have come up, and those people who self-identified as business owners um, by a statistically significant margin favored it more than um, the, the overall population. Now, I wish I could explain to you why that was not answered in the survey, but that was also a, a an interesting point to me. I don't know why. I'm, I'm only <laughs> suggesting that, that there may be a variance between a poll and pulling the lever on a Tabor vote where you're going to be spending a couple hundred bucks more as a private citizen and possibly two or $3,000 more uh, as a business owner. Yeah, uh, just a quick clarification question. The the mill increase is reflective of the top level, and I don't recall the three levels in the comp plan, but it is the top level in the comp plan, correct? Master plan. Master plan, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this would achieve the vision plan as set forth in um, the accepted master plan. Vision, got it. Go ahead and finish. Yeah. I'm simply going to um, reiterate the next steps for March 17th, where you have a scheduled public hearing, um, getting community feedback on our potential options that we've laid out. And then um, hopefully at that point, we'll get council direction so we can move forward with um, understanding kind of the 2020 ballot options. Sam, and then Bob. Great. If we could go back to slide 12, I'm just trying to square something I heard David say, and I'm just making sure that I, I track. This one? Yeah. Okay. So it looks to me, just city of Boulder city limits here, that roughly speaking, the residential assessed value is the same as non-residential assessed value. But that's not correct because the underlying values are assessed at a different rate. Is that correct? That's so, correct. So, so the, the assessed values are 1.9 and 2.1. So if we go to the next slide, then what the change means, now this is just the delta if we do the library district, is that the residents of $850,000 will pay $234 more. And an $850,000 commercial um, building will pay $949 more. Mm -hmm. So David said the increase for both residential and commercial in their tax bill will be 3 or 4%. Mm -hmm. 
it'll be roughly the same. Is that correct? It'll be roughly three or four percent, but the dollar amount will be a lot higher. That's correct, because um, commercial properties already tax pay at twenty nine percent. Yeah, already paying you know four times so as it's much. Three or four so percent, but regardless of really, type of property, but it's a larger. It says you know the percentages say three or four percent, but the dollar amount is actually four times as much. That's correct. Thank you. Well, and to be clear, this is not my question, but just to build on that, the 3 or 4% includes the school district tax, the county tax, all taxes. Okay. If you're just comparing it to city tax, it's a 30% increase, not a 3 or 4% increase. So we're going from 12 mills to 15 and a half mills. Um, my question yeah. is, um, I know you, I did read your slides ahead of time, so I know you have a couple of back of pocket slides, and I wanted to ask some questions about those. Because I, I seem to recall, and I think you can tell us, we did increase the library funding, in I think, in the last two years. Correct. To move it closer from baseline to, I can't remember the words, this from maintain to meet. Is that right? So that was... Yeah, so this is kind of the um, what we showed during the budget process. Um, in 2019, you added over, you know, close to $800,000 to the library budget that really pushed, um, achieved a lot of their maintain, pushed it slightly into meet community demand. In 2020, a little bit smaller increase, knowing that a majority of the meet community demand is in the North Boulder operating. And so what we do have planned for 2021 in our fund financial is an additional almost $2 million for NOBO operating. And th thank you. That was exactly what I was looking for. And then on top of that, didn't we kick in an extra 700000 in capital towards the North Boulder Library? That's correct. So over that's and above probably, what the voters yeah, approved. Yeah, inaccurate. Yeah, so that's, so that's just operating that's at that, that point. point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for pointing that. So are, are we going to have a discussion at some point in time, either tonight or March 17th, about alternative, I mean, we're kind of getting up into that light gray area, alternative ways to fund the library if we were not to form a district? I mean, is that a worthy discussion to have at some point in time? I think that's up to your call and your colleagues. Okay. I, I, yeah. I, for one, would be interested in having that discussion. I mean, if, if, if there was a way to fund the library adequately, I know we're, we're right there, but if people want it to be farther towards full on the gas tank, um, I'd be interested in knowing if, if there's a way to do it without raising taxes as significantly as what's being proposed. I think, um, just to be clear, too, because this is based upon the library master plan and not the bomb kind of analysis, what, what we do miss here is, again, that backlog issue. And so we can kind of adjust the numbers to make sure you're crystal clear how much more it would take to what we call adequately fund or um, in a sustainable fashion. J just as long as we're not, like, we have, we have backlogs in every department. Right, right. right. So it's just as long as we're not, like, reasonable, yeah. re reasonable within the yeah. scope of, like, the, all the, there's backlog and then there's backlog, right? We want to make sure that we're yeah. not, okay. And Katie, just a question for you. Why was the vision plan level chosen, the 3.85, as opposed to staying at the meet community demand? I simply chose the 3.85 to be consistent with what the library champions documentation is showing so that you guys could have similar numbers and the question would be for them about the vision. But council could choose the meet community demand as opposed to the vision. Yes, in terms presume, of the range yeah, of the mill levy. Presuming the petition doesn't get ahead of that, right, and outlines what the mill would be. Okay, thank you. Sam? Can we get a slide 20? You're also in the back pocket. <laughs> yeah. So this is great. Thank you for this breakdown. This is really helpful. <clears throat> so you add up the value of the buildings, leaving the land out of it. It's about $20 million, and then you throw in the art collection. So what is the value of the um, <clears throat> collection itself? Not the art collection, but the books and the, like the, you don't have to answer now. Yeah, it's we, the we kind of that. thing where, sure. you know, so here we have the building. Yeah. Presumably the collection will go as well. If we mm -hmm. have a district, it would all, wouldn't make any sense not to do everything. So it seems like what's missing here, yeah. it, we'd like to see in the future would be what's the value of the collection itself. Perfect. We can. So do the art that. collections, I assume, just art. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, and we're, yeah. I don't know that it moves the needle a ton. So I think the like the assets, the main libraries are the majority of. Okay. It, but we'll get that. Rachel, and then to Bob's question, and obviously I'm new here, but I would assume that we looked at, at that, or that the champions looked at that, or that the library master plan looked at at what our options were before we went into. Forming a district, you know, how else could we get to the, the higher level on the 
call it the gas tank, <laughs> the, the meter. If we did, I missed that meeting. So I don't think we really did. Or, a deep or that, dive on the that. that there was discussion and that that's how we got to forming the district. So I would just ask maybe David or, or anybody who was involved for our maybe if not tonight to to inform us of what discussions might have led up to this no, district I, notion. I, I believe that the library champions arrived at the 3.85 with the intent to fu fully fund the entire master plan. So that was their goal from the beginning. They were like, why would we do a library district without it including the best library they could have? I, I, I mean, we'd have to ask them precisely why. So I, I think I'm asking a little bit of a different question, and maybe I misunderstood Bob's, but I'm wondering um, why did we get to district rather than how else could we fund this? So I, I heard Bob to ask sort of, if we don't do a district, how else can we get to this, you know, gold standard? And so I'm wondering, did, was that discussion not had? Sure. So um, I can answer that, and then we can also provide a little bit of context. In 2000, or 2018, in November, George K. Baum, that was precisely what they were looking at, is different opportunities, whether it's within the city or whether it becomes a district. So you could see at different levels um, what it would take for city funding, either reducing it, increasing sales tax, increasing property tax, a combination. And so George K. Baum did look through all of that in addition to looking at the district um, and what we have chosen through the budget process is to increment fund some of those opportunities without raising taxes and having that discussion. I don't know if you want to add, Tanya. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think this is a um, perfect example of the need of the Financial Strategy Committee, too, because one of the last slides that Katie had outlined is all the other city needs, too. And so I would just um, maybe urge the conversation to not just look at a solution for the library, but what's the solution in context of all the city needs. Um, and that's the feedback that we've received from staff, from council members to staff, just on how the master plans are presented and how we may be looking at a lens of um, a financial strategy. They feel very one-off. So how do we balance all those needs? And especially in this case, looking at the general fund. Thank you, Tanya. And yeah, I was just going to make a comment to the council that we were going down the rabbit hole of tunnel, tunnel vision again, talking about funding this at the gold plate standard without considering all of the other needs. And that's exactly what the Budget Strategy Committee um, is trying to figure out how we're going to do that without every time we have something in front of us, that's what we want to do full throttle and gets us into trouble. Aaron. Adam, you want to go first? Sure. Just a real short question. To anyone's knowledge, have we ever ever fully funded a master plan <laughs> to, OK. So we always, it's my understanding, and, and I'll look to staff to correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding that every time we pass a master plan, we're passing it at the vision level, which means that we are accumulating all of these unfunded needs, which is why um, another reason why we're having this budget strategy discussion is we keep just getting everything further and further out of reach. I, I, oh, can I respond to that um, quick? So I think um, we also accept master plans. Um, that does not mean we're budgeting for the master plan. And so sometimes we get caught up in accepting and budgeting at the same time. And so they, they are very distinct. We are looking at how do we almost decouple those processes, but then also acknowledge that there are true budgetary needs within the master plan process. So we will be following up with council with more information on progress staff has made in this space, specifically um, our planning um, department in uh, partnership um, with finance um, later this year because that's a conversation that the Financial Strategy Committee has brought up. And it's really a symbol of where we're at right now in this conversation as well. To knowledge, um, I don't believe that we have ever, ever fully achieved a, a master plan vision by the time the next master plan is started. I think I was in the... Sorry. So just from a process perspective, just a process check-in, right? So so we're not going to do a whole lot of extra opining tonight, right? The, the Is that correct that March 17th is when we're really digging into, hey, what should we do 
I have a question. So then, Bob, to kind of to your point, that would be when we'd have a discussion about what are our, our alternatives, right? So, and I guess that, that would be, and I'll, I'll just throw out that like, so for example, on uh, alternatives, like we could raise other taxes, we could decrease funding from other programs, right? That would be a possibility. I just w just want to get out as, as we get in, go towards March 17th when we'll have this third discussion, just to keep in mind that it, the with the district, that we would be more or less matching um, the taxing base with the patrons of the library. And that in and of itself would realize additional revenue from people who currently use the library that are not currently contributing to the funding. And if we feel that um, the, the tax amount is too large, we could form the district, have it pass a tax increase, and we could lower our other taxes. So I'll just put that out there that that having, if we feel like this is too much extra tax burden, that doesn't mean the district is the wrong way to go. We could form the district and then lower city taxes correspondingly if we felt like that was the better alternative. So I just want to put out that's one of our possibilities out there. Okay. Aaron, that is no doubt true. However, that would be done outside of the structure of the financial studies that we're doing right now, which is to balance the needs across the different departments, whereas this is, as Mary, I think, indicated, it's a one-off focusing only on the library. And so if we were to do just what you described, we would be setting the library up to meet the vision plan of the library, and everything else would then have to decrement its plan in order to return money to the taxpayers. So I just wanted to make that point. Katie, I have another question for you on page 23. the same guy just but. so I understand um, we do have the highest sales tax rate of all of our peer cities but is that big blue bar in the middle so one two three four up is that the community culture and safety tax yes okay yes. and when does that expire just so I refresh at the end of 2021 2021 so we will drop back down and move more into the middle of the pack when that expires unless we decide to extend it again correct okay and our so we're 8.6 something 8.845 right now with the community culture and safety tax if i read your it's slide 23 yep, i thought there we yep. go okay there we go <laughs> um and um what's our limit we do not have a limit Technically, uh, on sales. Tax. Effectively, I guess. Is, is. Uh, effectively, what we have found is there are not that many communities that are over 10%. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Mayor Bai. Just out of curiosity, I understand taxes in the past have sunset or transferred. Has there been a time in our history that we've ever lowered taxes? <laughs> Um, tech, I do know this answer because I've had to answer it once. Um, technically, yes, we did it once, but it was a one-year tax for the fire training center that we did not renew, and it was several years ago, but no. Okay, so I'll just say, bear that in mind as we talk about possibly lowering taxes. I just wanted to rattle off some um, some of the results of the, let me back up for the new council members. Back in March and April of last year, we kind of wondered where the community was on, do they want a district, do they want to have a tax, how much tax will they pay, and so on and so forth. And so we, we hired, the library hired a, a pollster, and there was actually a polling committee that consisted of Johnny Teeter, who um, um, was on the library, had been on the library commission, and Lisa Marzell and me. We helped, we worked with the, the consultant to, uh, put together some questions, and then they pulled data, a statistically valid poll. And I just want to rattle off some of the some of the results um, from that poll, and this does lead to a, a request for information. Um, so, um, seventy-two percent of the of the respondents said they were not following this discussion. Maybe more are now, but back then, seventy-two percent were not following. Seventy-seven percent of our community did say that they supported some sort of increased in funding for the library, but then when we got into the details of how much they really supported that. Um, one, of the, one of the threshold questions we asked was at four mils, so slightly higher than this 385 we've been talking about, and 44% said that they would support a tax at that level. Of that 44%, 15% said they supported strongly, the rest were um, supported less strongly. Uh, and then we asked at different thresholds, and as you might imagine, as the tax went down from four mils down to about a third of that, um, the uh, uh, in, in the enthusiasm went up. Um, we'll have a pollster tell us what 
level of enthusiasm you need to have to pass a tax. When we asked the question about um, who's in favor of a property tax increase, 16% or one out of six said they favored a property tax increase. And then um, at near the end of it, we gave the, the respondents the choice of, of either a reallocation of existing funds towards the library or a tax increase. So when we gave them that choice, 40% uh, of the respondents said that they would rather have a reallocation of existing funds. 26% said they were in favor of a tax increase, and the rest were um, wanted either no change or they were unsure. And then the, uh, one of the, other, the final questions we asked is, are you in favor of um, forming a district at all without regards to tax? Do you want a district? And 45% said yes. Um, I would, so that's, those are the numbers I looked at the poll today. Could we have um, a, somebody come in and interpret those for us at the next meeting? I'm going to let Tanya answer that. Um, so I have been in initial contact with Bob Drake um, and will will hopefully be able to connect with him before um, the March 17th public hearing. Because I, as I recall from past polls, it's, it's not as simple as 51% of the people say they're in favor of a tax and therefore it's going to pass. I think there's a, I think mm -hmm. Bob would tell or somebody would tell us that the, the threshold's a little higher than that. Is that right? Yes. And what we can also do is, well, um, also see if we can reach out to um, the individual who conducted the poll from last year. Um, if there's, we can answer those questions and if there's other questions from council, we can work with that individual to have that information in writing. Yeah, my too. questions are more on trip to, for yeah. example, if, if 44% of the people say that they're in favor of a tax, what does that, does that mean the tax is going to pass or not? I mean, I know it's less than 50, but I mean, at what threshold? And so it's more of an interpretation. The methodology is fine. I don't care about the mm -hmm. methodology. It's really more of an interpretation. In Boulder, Colorado, what does it take from a polling standpoint to get to a successful okay. ballot measure? And Bob would be great for that, I yeah. think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Katie? Aaron. I think this is my last one. Um, Although, I, Bob, I, I think just to those those numbers, um, there were a lot of undecideds. So I think you quoted like how many support, but there are a lot of undecideds. So yeah, and that's that's another question I would have for Bob is what how how do we allocate the undecideds? Do we assume that they're ultimately supportive or not, or allocated? So that'd be a good question for Bob. Right, because I think that of the people who did have an opinion on the district, it was two to one in favor. There were a lot of people who were like, I don't know. Anyway, so but Kim, we haven't cross-examined you in a long time, so I wanted to get <laughs> I wanted to get one one other question. So there, there's the the question of what mill rate might be put on the ballot for the Tabor election if we go down this route, right? So now, if the petition is filed, then the petition states the mill rate. That's correct. But if we so but if we take control of the process and pass a resolution to form the district, at what point does the exact mill rate get decided and by whom? It would be decided by you, and it would need to be determined uh, at the point where you have to certify the election question, which I think is probably September 6th. So is it decided that? by us or, like, the council or the council and the commissioners? Like who? Yeah, it would be the two of you. So the it would be the establishing Establishing entity bodies entities. would agree on a mill rate. Yes. So I'll just keep that in mind that we don't necessarily have to pick 3.85 as well. So we can pick a different number. And also just um, some more information for the hearing, Katie. Um, just the options that would exist for a district to um, provide some sort of tax relief for people. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's certainly something that could be negotiated within the IGA, and it would be up to the district to provide whatever type of program it sees fit. And again, I think you would have some control over that if you wanted to look at different opportunities. For rebates. I wanted to go back to a question that Mark asked you earlier about what would be the benefits for people from Gun Barrel and from or agenda reading is that when it comes to servicing the area, what does that really mean? What are some of the some of the stuff that people will get that is tangible, because I think that's a question probably a lot of people are thinking as well. Okay, is it just in a tax increase and then just people are just driving in? But is, is there possibilities for pop-up libraries in what does that mean with districting and not districting? Um, 
Well, I'll start and let David take over. So again, the 3.85 by the library champions is intended to accomplish the vision, which does have a gun barrel library and an additional, you know, library somewhere yet to be seen based upon the population use. So I think the um, argument is that by doing this, you would see tangible um, assets being built within your you know, property that you wouldn't, we don't have planned in our budget. So yeah, the, um, the champion's plan includes a gun barrel library by 2024. And I think a NIWAT library to follow as soon as possible thereafter. So that, that is within their funding model, assuming that a library board of trustees wanted that to go forward. Any other questions? All right. So this is just a question for Kim, if you've seen this before. So it seems like a kind of entry level question here is whether the voters of Boulder would like to have their assets run by a library district rather than by the city through the city council and the, the, <clears throat> the board of commissioners. So um, have you ever seen uh, cities try and decide whether their residents wanted something like this to happen ahead of time rather than just going for the Tabor because as we've said, two thirds of the voters are, will be Boulder residents in the district and 80% of the, the uh, taxing base is gonna be in the city. So have you ever seen cities try and decide, like you gave the example of Aurora, for instance, where something was set up in a way that it didn't work and they went through the, IGA and the whole brain damage and they got to the end and the answer was no. Have you seen folks trying to decide ahead of time whether their residents cared for the idea? Um, I, I really haven't, other than you know the public hearing that's required for the resolution. Um, I haven't seen an effort made. I mean, there's polling and things like that that go on, but nothing really beyond that. It's been kind of, let's just rely on the election and see what happens. Thank you. There was a, in this handout that David gave, one of these handouts that David gave us today, tonight, there was all sorts of references to polls. This, this organization, this city polled, and this city polled, and there was a poll, and then a resolution. Can, uh, and maybe you're not prepared to, to drill into that tonight, but I see the word poll a bunch of times. Is that, like, is that were some of the cities doing what Sam, Sam suggested? Do you know? Or I don't know who, who generated this. This is something that the city attorney's office requested today. Um, and so that document you have is from the state library. Um, I asked them to decipher what poll meant and um, it wasn't a poll in the sense of polling. I think it had to do with um, the establishment of Tabor, the establishment of Colorado library law. And so polling is essentially is they went for a vote. Ah, okay. um, so the, the one, there is one library. Uh, yeah, that's not your question. Yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. Just to be clear, the, um, the public hearing we're having on March 17th is not the public hearing to pass a resolution or-, or That's it, correct, it's, it's, a, it's to inform our path forward. Okay, is so what that if we were to have public a public hearing, hearing on a resolution, that would be at a that would be date. at a later date. Okay. Thank you. I was just looking at this map, and it seems I don't know what is the percentage, but a large percentage of the areas in Colorado there are districts and I wanted to know, maybe even if not now in the future and March 17th, you can tell us a little bit more about their processes and what do you think it worked? And I think it was mentioned earlier when it comes whether by resolution, because from looking at this, it seems like districting may be the wave of the future, but what does that really mean by looking at this map? Um, we had provided a memo last year that talked about a couple of district formations, and I can go ahead and add some others to that and um, get that distributed to you when the time comes. Doesn't this provide part of that answer? 
I, I think it does. I mean, we need the the state library has to have more time. It was like like a couple hours before this meeting, and they would like to dig through it. So what it looks like is that there have been 59 districts formed. Um, all but one of them was formed by apparently by or I don't know, maybe 80 percent were formed by a resolution. Um, my f sense is that I, I think two or three of those districts have merged, but this data is from 2014. The map that you have is from 2011, and I don't believe the State Library has updated those maps uh, or the or that document, but they would be happy to dig into it more. Um, so at this point, there are 57, libra 57 library districts in the state of Colorado. There are 31 municipal libraries, and there are 11 county libraries. Of the 11 county libraries, they serve 675,000 citizens, uh, residents of Boulder, of Colorado, 575,000 of which are Jefferson County. Um, the municipal libraries serve, I think, 1.8 million. The district libraries serve 3 million. So. Yeah, and, and then in addition, so in the cover memo to the information as well, and this was from the email that was sent um, by the state librarian, um, there's a list of the districts that were formed by election in there. So there, it looks like there was uh, seven since 1988 that have been formed by an election. Sam. So this has nothing to do with the library. Please don't adjourn the meeting once we're done with the library. I have one question about the tribal consultation signups. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. See you on the 17th. All right, Sam, you had a question about the tribal council. Yeah, so um, one minor thing. Adam, you, you aren't going to come to any of these. You can't. Or did you? There are two Adams on there. Oh. Oh, there are two Adams on here. Okay. So then, the, so you signed up for two. So the next question is, it looks like we are oversubscribed significantly on the 17th for the limit to sessions, and nobody signed up on the 18th. Did in, was that done intentionally or was that by accident? Can I don't know. I was the first one to sign up, so I haven't seen what happened. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I'll be happy to fill in, um, but we're going to be oversubscribed, you know, by one or two in every session. On so could we do this? Could we have um, staff take a look at that and then tell us where we're oversubscribed, where we're undersubscribed, and see if people want to move around? And Sure. It or might, add or add more. Might be just as easy to huddle and do it now, but we can do it. However, I mean, Doodle would be a well, way I to can't do it too. See it. I, I know. Here, here's the dividing line between. I know. The two I days. know. <laughs> and Junie, did you get a chance to fill that out? Because I don't. I don't know that your name's on there. You must be the second the other, Adam. The other Adam. <laughs> I was, <laughs> so can I make a suggestion since we're at yeah. the end of the meeting? Um, so we did the hard copy since we haven't fully adapted the new council rules with the doodle poll. So we could test the doodle poll in this um, space, requesting a similar process to what we did last year where you fill out all of your availability and then we try to spread the time so that all council members can attend. So we will be clear, please respond with all of your options and then we'll determine it from there. Yeah. I, I just didn't right? want people to lose out mm -hmm. who right. could otherwise have gone. Okay. And I'll just, I, I was going to uh, dedicate one day to this. So if uh, that should be the 18th instead of the 17th, that could just switch days. I just don't want to do a couple one day and a couple the next day. We'll make note of that. The problem with the all availability thing is I can't be all available at all of them. I can, I can be all available, but I can only go to like two. Yeah, so. well, well, I mean, okay. that's another thing for, for Aaron or I or any of us to sign up for, quote, a full day would occupy, would keep somebody out, perhaps. Oh, and so, I, I'm sorry. 
I'm only, I'm willing to do a full day. I don't need to do a full day. I'm just saying. I, so kick me out for for so, parts. Of so this, this is why I think Tanya's idea of all of your available slots and have staff do their best to make sure that everybody gets a couple slots at least. That's what I thought we were doing on that piece of paper. <laughs> was that not because it was you know you can. Uh, we can do like it that way. With up to two, I thought is. Let's, that let's go. Let's go with the doodle poll. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. And, and the the. Uh, Rachel, the only reason I asked the question was there's nobody on the 18th at all, and so I, I feel like it needs balancing by somebody. All right. Um, one final thing before we adjourn. I just wanted us to thank Heidi very much for her service. Friday is her Heidi. last day, and um, I know I'm going to miss her a lot, and I think she's done an incredible job. And she almost went away once. Maybe she'll almost go away twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you and, so much. And she, she, she will be done. the new clerk for the city of Erie, so they're getting a wonderful yeah. person. Lucky. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Live from Paris, on France 24.